Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. This is, a, this is a work session, not one of our regular county commission meetings. Uh, we have invited guests, uh, specifically ABSS and ACC, um, and the superintendent and the uh, chairman right. of each of those. But other than that, we will not have guest speakers uh, at this work session. Uh, we have an open house, uh, actually, um, public, hearing. public hearing scheduled for Monday, 6.30 p.m. It'll be in the historic courthouse up the street. It will not be in this room. And at that one, any and everybody will be uh, welcome to speak at that meeting at the, uh, at the, the budget uh, open house. Uh, okay. Any questions from anybody on that issue? We have two other work sessions. Um, they are scheduled for June 10 and June 12. Uh, and we will use those if needed. If not, we have the luxury of canceling those if, we're, uh, if we feel we do not need them. Okay. Mr. Chairman, could I? On the agenda, we do not have, uh, we're, we're going to have a prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance anyway, even though it's not on our agenda. Mr. Turner? And while you were talking about other, other budget work sessions, Mr. Chairman, June 10th, I have a conflict at, uh, at 9.30 a.m. Uh, I have motions uh, up the street that I cannot miss. You mean just because they're spirit court judges? <laughs> <laughs> just to let you know, I mean, we can hey, well, address we that. We'll look at calendars and see if we can we read it. we got an audience here this morning, so. Correct. June 10th. Look at your calendars and see what June 10th later in the day we can call it. I'm good. I've got a doctor's appointment. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good too. I'm good this morning. What time could you be free, Commissioner Turner? Thing. The judge says the morning. I mean, it could, uh, I could go into the afternoon. It's two o'clock. They're the one o'clock. <laughs> I, I don't know. Thirty. Doctor. Yeah. It's a number of motions. I, I mean, two o'clock is reasonable. I won't be able to be late. All right. I'm looking at staff at this point because. Now, I'm willing to go to like four o'clock or something, but that impinges upon your time, not so much ours. Um, Staff will make ourselves available when it's convenient for the board. How about three o'clock? I'm good with any time that afternoon. That works. Three o'clock every morning. Yep. Three o'clock okay. on June 10th. So the uh, June 10th meeting will be at 3 p.m as opposed to 9.30 a.m. Mr. Turner, do you have a quick indication for us? Sure. We you bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, we thank you for having Brother Bill back with us and hope that he continues to improve and that he continues to be able to, to fulfill his duties to the county. But also, please, Lord, Make him remember to monitor his own health. <laughs> not to push himself. And that the, the most important thing is that he is healthy and that his family is um, is awesome. Lord, we thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you uh, stand with the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
done a great job, but you kept it short. <laughs> Okay, Ms. York. Good morning, Commissioners. This is your first budget work session. I just wanted to orient you to how our time is structured. Um, both Dr. Ingle and Dr. Harrison are going to um, summarize their requests to the board in about 15 minutes. We have time after each one of those for Q&A with the board. And then we'll wrap up um, with any questions that the commissioners have for county staff. As you have been giving us questions all along about the budget, we've taken those down in writing. And so uh, Rebecca Crawford, our budget director, will go over some of those at the end. Just a running tally of questions um, that you may have that we can try to address for you. And please feel free to add to that list. If there are any other requests for information along the way, we will um, work on getting a response back to you. So I think we're ready to proceed, and we were going to start with uh, Alamance Community College's request this morning. And let me uh, welcome both ACC and ABSS. We're not going to time you, but we're going to have a little hook that we're not, <laughs> that we're not timing you, obviously. Uh, yes, sir. We all know who you are, but if you would, when you get to the podium, just announce. Absolutely. Clicker, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Uh, I'm Ken Engel. I'm the president of Alamance Community College, a whopping four months into the job and excited to, to spend a few minutes with you today talking about uh, our budget and the great things happening at the college. Wonderful to see you back and, you, and doing well. Uh, wishing you continued, continued health Thank you. and uh, success. I know it's been uh, a challenging, challenging time. Uh, so uh, excited to share with you what's happening at the college and uh, again our budget request today. I wanted to start out giving you a little bit of context and, and I, I'm confident that my time will not require a book at the end of it. So I think this will be pretty brief and, and hopefully pretty easy to, to step through. But I think it's good to start out with some context of the things happening at the college and uh, how we're working to serve the community. Um, I Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, uh, I know I'm losing my hair, but that's not uh, that's, um, that's, uh, um, the, uh, <laughs> thank you. The, uh, you know, our job every single day is to serve the community to the, to the greatest effect possible. And we do that by really connecting the community to the workforce. Uh, through workforce education, through our academic programs, whether it be our, our transfer programs to our wonderful university partners, uh, whether it be through our two-year programs like our nursing program, our HVAC program, uh, great, and many other great programs we have at the college, or short-term short workforce training, which is a huge part of what we do in a significant growth area for the college, and that's meeting the immediate demands of the workforce and exist, both existing and emerging workforce that we have. Um, it's also important the partnerships that we have with our wonderful friends at the school system and others here in the community to just make sure that we're doing that work every day of connecting the community to the workforce um, to really promote economic development within our area. And so with that, I just kind of like to level set where we are today. Uh, so when we look over the past year, we served over 12,000 students at the college between all of our programs that we offer, and that's going up. Uh, our enrollment for this summer is up over 15%. Uh, from last summer, uh, and we're already tracking almost 6% up this fall. So we're seeing incredible growth in, in a lot of ways that mirrors the growth we're seeing within the community as a whole. Um, as we see our community grow and economic development happen within the community, we're seeing an increasing need for a trained workforce, and that's what we're here to do. So we're seeing students come to the college, and we're working hard to connect with, with uh, businesses and, and other organizations to help meet that need. Currently, we have more than 50 programs of study. Um, in fact, just in the past couple of weeks, we submitted to the state board um, two new programs of study around artificial intelligence and data analytics um, in response to significant needs that we see within those spaces across multiple industries that are both in the area and uh, within the larger region. As I mentioned, our enrollment is up more than 14%, actually over 15% for the summer. And uh, currently, we're closing in on 2,000 dual-enrolled high school students. 
um, that, are, that are not only taking high school classes and working to finish their high school diploma, but are taking college classes at the same time. And uh, that is something we are incredibly excited about. It is one of our strongest partnerships with the school system and is really a wonderful opportunity that is um, either low or no cost depending on specific courses uh, for those students. It's a, my, my son actually takes advantage of that very program uh, as well. It's a, it's a great program. Um, and when we talk about university transfer, we're over 20 university transfer agreements right now, and we're looking at expanding that even further. This past Friday, I had a, had a meeting with a potential university partner looking at options to expand not only access to four-year education through the community college, um, but affordable access to four-year education. So that was a big part of our discussion. And uh, as I mentioned, the workforce development area of the college, which is those short-term training programs, is one of our, it is our biggest growth area at the college. It's up over 20% over the past year. So we, we are seeing uh, incredibly exciting things happen at the college. Uh, we're looking at new opportunities, like I mentioned, within the AI and analytics space, as well as health program expansion and other short-term workforce needs that we see. Our small business center, we're looking at how we can expand the footprint of it. We're, we're working closely with the Chamber of Commerce on that, uh, that project. So really excited about the things happening at the college and how we're working every day to, to serve the wonderful people of Alamance County. Um, I think it is good as we as we talk about our budget to give you context for where the, the, mm -hmm. the county support really helps support what we're doing. And, and that is primarily seen through the, uh, the physical plant that we have of our campuses and our facilities, uh, whether it be at our main campus or at the Dillingham Center and other things related to that. So we've had a couple of new buildings come on online over the past couple of years, the Student Services Center and the Biotechnology Center of Excellence. If you have not had the opportunity to see those, you are invited anytime to come on campus and I'm happy to give you a tour and, and show you around and uh, show you those exciting buildings and the things we're doing there. Uh, the Covington Education Center, we're getting ready to expand a classroom facility out there that has been funded by the Golden Leaf Foundation, uh, which will be a barn that is also a classroom space. Uh, it's really innovative, really, really neat place. Uh, so it, again, we'd love to have you at any of these spaces. Our Public Safety Training Center, as you know, is under construction right now. In fact, this next week I'll be out there on site uh, uh, looking at how things are progressing. Um, the pad is down from the, the last update that I received and uh, we're, we're excited to see what happens there. Incredibly supportive for the support of the community for that project and certainly the legislature and the federal government as well. And, um, and uh, as I mentioned, the, the Covington Education Center, we continue to expand in that space. Uh, so really excited about the work that we're doing there. Uh, but we're not just looking at new expansion opportunities. We're also working every day. And one of the biggest, uh, biggest jobs that Andrea Rollins, our CFO, has, who I think many of you know very well, uh, who, who is retiring from us here soon. But we're, we're thankful for all of the tremendous work that she has done and continues to do. Um, we're also looking at where we can be as efficient with our funds as possible at the college and make sure that we're, we're being very, uh, very intentional and, and uh, uh, good stewards of the funds that we receive, both certainly from the county as well as from the state and any other sources. We have a number of different funding sources that support our work. Uh, so these are a few examples of things that we've done to, to really look at the college operations um, really look at how we can make sure that we're being as effective and efficient with those funds as possible. So going into the budget request, um, and we try to keep it very simple and straightforward. Uh, I, I like simple and easy to read and straightforward. Um, uh, uh, Heidi and her team have been wonderful to work with as they always are and incredibly supportive of the work that we're doing. And we're very appreciative for their partnership in this. Uh, this past year, uh, I've broken this down into two primary categories, current expenses, which is our operational expenses that are from county funds, and capital repairs and maintenance, or capital expenses. Um, I'll start with capital because it's the easy one. Uh, we are not asking for any additional funds within our capital expenses at this time. Our building projects and capital projects are progressing as intended within the budgets that have been allotted and identified for those, for those projects. We feel really good about that. We're very appreciative of the support. We, we're in a good place with that right now. Our operating expenses this past year, um, you all provided $4 million of funding, a little over $4 million of funding for uh, operational expenses. Uh, the request that we submitted this year was for $5.7 million. 
And within that request, we took into account a number of different factors. We took into account the increased expenses that we see coming from utilities and insurance. We took into account certainly the new buildings that have come online, uh, the areas that we're working to support the college. And uh, 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 the, the, the proposed budget that came back this past week was at 4.87 million uh, to help support the work that we're doing. Uh, we are certainly supportive of the 4.87 million to support our work. Uh, at the college that is a significant step to help us support what we're doing to, to serve the community overall and we're very appreciative uh, for that number as well as uh, the other elements of the budget that have been recommended um, uh, by uh, by the county to you all for for voting so uh, while this is a little bit of a difference from what we fully requested uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say this is a significant step towards helping support what we're doing and taking into account the increased costs and expenses that we've seen around uh, two examples again being utilities and insurance those areas that really can support us. Uh, we feel good that that this will get us much closer to being able to support our overall operational costs and expenses. Um, it's certainly, uh, while we would love to see it fully go to the 5.7 million, I'm completely supportive of that. If you decide that that's uh, where those dollars need to be prioritized, we understand that you all have a, a lot of requests coming your way and a lot of things that have to be prioritized. And so we feel this will be a significant step <coughs> in helping us support the college and helping with the work that we're doing every single day. So uh, so this is, this is the layout of what we've requested. Uh, what the team of the county has recommended to you all and uh, certainly what we received last year for context. Um, so uh, again, we're very th thankful for this and certainly um, excited for this, this step uh, for us if you all uh, choose either number uh, on the right hand side to, to go with uh, the, either the 4.87 or the 5.72. Uh, so with that, like I said, I tried to keep it simple and straightforward as much as possible. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you have, and uh, you will forgive me if I may look towards Andrea uh, as she is the in the very details expert and, uh, and may be able to jump in and, and answer any questions that, uh, that you have as well. I would point out to the board and the expanded packet that we got, uh, this found notebook, Go to pages 75 and 76 for ACC. <clears throat> Ms. Thompson. Oh, Ms. Thompson. Yeah, I ju just for clarification purposes, when you're talking about the dual enrollment program, how does that pay out? I know the state gives so much per student in public education. How does that work? Sure. So we're, we're funded on what's called an FTE model, a uh, full-time equivalency model, which is a little bit different than the ADM model that the state funds the, the K-12 system. Um, and forgive me, I'm not an expert on the K-12 funding side of, of that equation by any means. I would defer to our friends at ABSS for that. But uh, essentially, it's a formula that's based on the number of hours that a student takes. And the Career and College Promise is a uh, state-subsidized program. Uh, to support dual enrollment for high schools uh, as part of that FTE, FTE calculation. So it's funded, funded largely by the state. There are other expenses that fall into that category like books and materials. We try to keep those as low as possible and there are different circumstances where either our foundation helps pay those, partnership with the school system helps pay for those expenses so that as much as possible that is a zero cost equation for our high school students. So, so it's sort of still kind of an additional amount that goes into that as far as what the General Assembly is going to give on a hard line. So That's great. Okay. That's great. Mainly around the supplies piece. The okay. supplies. It's a deal, I'm going to say. It, it, it really is. If, uh, if you have a high school student that is a junior or a senior or you know one, the CCP is a wonderful option. It is, uh, uh, particularly in the courses that are university transfer <coughs> courses, it is, um, it is a great great program to be a part of. So like I said, my 17-year-old son is part of <laughs> part of that program as well. So it's a good one. It's a very good one. Mr. Uh, thank you, Dr. <coughs> uh, are you able to monetize the increase in utility costs that you're facing above last year? I, I will look at Andrea uh, and do you have that number right here close by? So the dollar amount or the percentage Utility bills in general, 
were reported to us. So I've got a report here from Duke Energy specifically talking about commercial and industrial increases planned over the next three years. They have modified this number since we uh, since January, and I'm not sure what the exact numbers are now, but they were in double digits over a three year time period. So that we built that into our budget modeling. Um, what we're seeing for ACC is in addition to these incremental costs and perhaps water and sewer, we're, we're city of Graham, so that, that puts us in the five, nine percent, ten percent increases. Um, the, uh, in, in addition to those incremental increases in utility costs, we have our new buildings coming online. So what we're seeing is that we have two new buildings come on this year. We've got our Covington Farm Center with increased usage, and then we're expecting the Public Safety Training Center in the next fiscal year as well. So we're modeling on both of those things at the same time. When you said double digits, do you mean percentage increase? or Percentage increase. Okay, so above 10? Uh, yes, so it was right at 12 or 15. And when you said that the that the state was modifying up or, you said that there are the modification from January, is that up or down? I think it came down in the third year, so their long-term projection was it seemed to be that they were communicating that there were increases planned in the next three years to then level off. Okay. But I'm not an expert in the industry, so please don't take that as the final word. But basically, so a 12 to 15 percent increase in utility expenses that reflected or that would come out of the additional 848, 848,000 that the county managers recommended. And this so, is tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand dollars for us. It's up to up to a hundred thousand dollars. Easily. Mr. Turner, let me interrupt just temporarily. Uh, Bruce, do we have an extra mic for yes, folks is. that are not at the podium? We, we don't. We can unhook this one, or yeah, we don't okay. have. Okay, Andrew, you may want to go to the mic then, because the folks know. out in, in the audience can hear hear, but. People out in uh, broadcasting lane cannot. <laughs> um, Sorry. Mr. Oh yeah, no, that's fine. Mr. So if we're, I don't know, let's use hundred thousand dollars as a round number for the increase in utility costs that would include the increases plus the new buildings. That leaves seven hundred forty-eight thousand dollars increase in your budget. What are you planning to do with that increase? So. The types of things that are increasing, what we found is that in the last two years, the uh, inflation that's happening in the world was costing us money, and we had to dip into our savings to cover costs. So some of the increase that we have requested is just putting us at current uh, costs. It's not that we would be spending it on anything new, we would be spending it on doorknobs, many blinds, window replacement, things like that, that are just more expensive than they were two years ago. Some other things that we're seeing cost increase in are, um, we did renegotiate uh, uh, some major contracts, and those things had gone up as well, same thing. Their costs went up because of inflation, and uh, although we had competitive bids and we took the lowest bids, those things are more expensive than they were in the past. So we're not anticipating additional activities. We're just hoping to keep, keep up with inflation and make sure that we continue to maintain our buildings. They have a, um, an ongoing list of repairs, maintenance, uh, small projects that they handle out of these funds. And those things, um, that we, that's the only thing that we can control is how much we repair things. So as long as we are maintaining funding to meet inflation, we can also maintain our buildings. Is there anything out of the $848,000 increase that you would use to put on new programs or new services or anything? Anything new? Not really, except for the new buildings that are coming online that we would need to support the utility and operational costs for. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, now, this past year we actually dipped into other funding sources to cover the, the expenses for building operations and, and campus operations uh, because we had you know budget that we needed to work with and from from a county perspective so this wouldn't this is not none of this money would go towards expanding into new programming opportunities we, we would use other funding sources to work on that and to look at opportunities for that what do you mean what, what other sources so we were funded by certainly by the county for for operations of our campuses 
funded by the state uh, yeah. for our FTE and other operations. Um, we have our foundation, we have other funding sources, we go for grants, things like that, where we look at opportunities when, when the funding that's part of our state and county allotment uh, that covers primarily our operational cost and our current operational cost, and including that state piece that's focused on the current operation from a academic programming standpoint. Um, we look at those grants and other funding opportunities whenever we look to expand. Uh, there's not a dedicated funding source that's, that's uh, every once in a while there will be an allotment that is provided by the state or another group that says this is for program expansion, uh, but that's, it depends on the year, it depends on the, the specific budget. So we, we're always looking at multiple funding sources. Okay, Could any of those other funding sources that you mentioned be used to cover the increases that are currently being allocated to the $840,000 increase from the county? I'd like to answer that because sure. I have a very simple way of thinking about it, and he's going to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> but. When we charge, the only thing that ACC, the funding for, uh, that comes from the state, is restricted for education purposes. We can't spend it on utility bills. They don't allow it. Um, we can't spend it for other areas that, uh, building repairs. We can't spend it on the facilities. We have to spend it on the students. The only, and then, of course, the county funds is for the facilities. And then we have institutional funds where we're allowed to charge very small pieces of um, like a, a technology fee to our students or maybe an activity fee for our students and what we intend to use those fees for is the technology that allows them to learn. We intend to spend it on um, support for students who can't pay for their own books, things like that. Legally, we could spend it for utility bills because that also benefits students if we keep the lights on. Um, but that's really not the intent of those fees. So when he talks about institutional fees, those are donations. When people donate to us and say, here, use it for your, your students, you can use it for students or you can use it for utility bills. If we charge fees, we can use it for their intended purpose or we can use it for our, our, our emergency needs. And I would say, in, uh, you know, I've been in community colleges 18 years, you know, going on 19 years. and. Any any fiscal year, there's always there's always uh, when you look at fees, for example, there's always fees that are distributed towards towards maintenance of things and, and certainly towards new things at times. Um, uh, as a whole, that that tends to be a very small component of it because to Andrea's point, even within our foundation funds, which we have an incredibly robust foundation that does great work, um, a lot of times those donations are restricted. That someone will donate and say, you know, I'm donating, donating this amount of money for a scholarship for this program, and here's the requirements around it. And um, so, uh, so within any funding source that we have, there certainly are statutorial and, and legal restrictions that we have within the state board code and and, uh, and law uh, and legal requirements that we have about how we use those funds. Uh, but where there is flexibility in how we use funds, we certainly try and use that as much as possible to support students. That's certainly our first goal every time. Um, but, uh, but where we need to use them in other places, and we can use them in other places, we certainly do. Okay. Mr. Lashley. No, I don't have any. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chairman. I don't really have any specific questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Turner, for uh, your questions. <coughs> Those were pretty much down the same line. I was going to head down. Um, kudos to the manager. I think she actually saw that you folks were going to need some extra money, and she put it in her budget in a 19% increase, which I think is probably the right way to go. Um, I understand I understand the utility bills and the new buildings coming on, but also I think the county manager took care of that as well. Um, I think you guys are doing a great job, and thank you for being here today. Absolutely, thank you, Anna. And I will echo I uh, the county manager uh, in York's office has been and continues to be great to work with and a, a great nice. partner for us. So we're very appreciative for her recognition of and, and the entire team's recognition of where our needs are. Absolutely. Mr. Well, I have the uh, honor of serving on the board of trustees from the college and on the finance and the building and grounds committees. So uh, I was right in the middle of the mix last year on the finance committee when Andrew was trying to figure out how we were going to meet the budget. And uh, I have to give credit 
to the whole team over at ACC because they worked and did a yeoman's job of cutting and managing to the budget they had been given. And we were coming out right where we ought to be. But it's, I'm not going to say it's not been tough because it has. I know it's been hard on them. And uh, um, the utility cost, insurance cost, and things of that nature, and the mere fact of inflation that all of us are experiencing has had a tough, that's been the main driver of the expenses. Uh, so that's what they're dealing with. Two new buildings right now, and a third new building coming online, and a fourth new project coming online as well. So, thank you very much, guys. Good, a good, a good presentation. Just kind of wrapping up, I really don't have any major questions. Um, I really like what the county manager proposed, um, and I think she hit pretty much 50% of your requests. Um, but still, only. Uh, 850,000 additional dollars. That's incredible. Uh, if everybody did that, the county taxpayers and everybody would be in really good shape. I'd like to also comment about your accelerated program for uh, high school kids. Two of my grandchildren completed high school with each had two advanced degrees coming out of graduation from high school. Uh, therefore, entered uh, both at UNCG uh, almost as juniors going in their, what would have otherwise been their freshman year. Tremendous cost and uh, cost savings and tremendous advancement on where they are today. Uh, one is completing her doctorate uh, and the other is completing his Juris Doctorate. Uh, he's, just completed uh, his third year of law school at Campbell uh, and uh, pretty much at the top of his class uh, thanks to what you and ABSS did uh, helping with his education uh, and just want to say thank you for doing such a wonderful job and the expansion of this new training facility for example the new barn all these things are brand new and will be the envy of most all counties. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, don't, I, like, I, I don't have any proposed change, Madam Manager. John, can I just ask one, can I just follow yeah. up with something yeah, just for reassurance? I know when um, the vote for the training center, you guys <coughs> put over $3 million of your own money in that, so to speak, from your fund balance, and it got you to a really dangerous low of 100000 Nowadays, they don't buy Z bushes for a big place like what you got. Sure. But um, after this, are you going to be safe and a healthier situation after this budget? Because okay. yeah, that's absolutely. a scary thing to think you can just rely on. And and, and I appreciate money. that. Th th this is a significant step uh, for okay. us and, and certainly a uh, very much appreciated uh, support for what we've seen from an inflation standpoint. As far as Public Safety Training Center goes, um, we certainly have had the, the support through the bond project uh, uh, from the county. We've also had tremendous support from the state legislature um, and what they've provided to help fund that facility as well as the federal government mm -hmm. actually had an appropriation within their budget. Uh, uh, even in the midst of many budget challenges that they faced at the federal level uh, to support that facility. So uh, we're in really good shape as that construction move forward, moves forward. And, um, every every we, we track it very closely and we're right on track. So we I just know lights and electricity and insurance is one thing that that's just life. Sure. But with a low fund balance, something will break, and you just can't have that chasing you. I just want to make sure you got a healthy fund balance in case the bottom hits. Absolutely. In this world, it hits often, unfortunately. Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, I think yes. the funds Ms. Commissioner Thompson is talking about is your capital reserve. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Yes. Uh, yes. The, the 536,000. <coughs> I'm talking about the one that was just over 100,000. Yeah, yes. It's capital reserves. So I can't speak to the capital reserves that the county holds on our behalf, but I would defer to them to tell you what that balance is. Yeah. But I do know that we do, we do hold some funds yeah. with the state as well. The state has provided some, some infrastructure funding that has made a difference and, and we are able to uh, 
we've been successful getting grants for capital as well. So those are two options for ACC in addition to the capital reserves. Yeah, our capital reserve for ACC is around 200,000. We've earned some interest on that. Okay. But I did wanna um, pull up this slide. You've seen this before from the manager's presentation. I don't wanna lose sight of the additional funding components that the county is giving to ACC next year beyond current expense and capital we have debt service payments, we are transferring money to their capital reserve. So your total contribution to ACC next year is around 10 million, 10.1 million. And there you can see the requested and recommended percentages um, in the budget, recommended budget. All I might add too is the uh, public safety training center when it comes online with the additional funds that we got from the state and from the federal government, is going to be a state-of-the-art, yeah. top-of-the-line public safety training center, the envy of the other centers of the state. We've been, we've been receiving comments from other colleges that want to transfer or have some of their BLET training on our campus. Um, uh, law enforcement from all over the state want to train their officers here for upcoming training. Uh, everything from Highway Patrol, SBI, um, uh, federal agencies like the uh, FBI, the uh, what's it, uh, firearms guys, uh, ATF, ATF. Um, just multiple agencies are looking forward to having our centrally located facility. Because so many agencies have had to go east and west to get the training on facilities that aren't as nice as ours. We, we we had our BLET graduation this past week and second largest class wasn't it? It was it was second largest class ever for for our BLET program and uh, uh, one of if not the largest BLET classes in the entire state and so uh, and they were not just uh, Alamance County residents that were part of that class it was some surrounding counties and other partner counties that that are sending their sending their potential officers. And we don't even have a facility ready yet. <laughs> we're, we're, we're racing fast. <laughs> and the last class before this one was the largest. It was. At 50. That's great. Board, any other questions? We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate it. EBSS. My next life, I'm going to be a community college president. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lashley, we only had an opportunity to meet one time, but please know my prayers have brought something with you as, uh, as well. Thank you, sir. And welcome back. I got a uh, text early this morning from a good friend of mine. I can't understand why I've gone back to work. Mm. And he, he said that uh, I've got a, we got a tea time at 845. Yeah. It's our favorite golf course. And I text back and said, eat your heart out. I like to present a budget to <laughs> so here I am, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and I appreciate Dr. Engel mentioning the, um, the early college and, and the comments of, uh, of commissioners on that. Because we just had our first graduation of the year, the Alamance um, early college, and 80% of the kids who graduated had a Associate of Arts or Associate of Science degree, so that's a pretty incredible way to start off the uh, The graduation season. Um, I think our, our challenges uh, that we're facing right now have been well documented. And I brought the work here, so. But I want to say that since I've been here, I have had an opportunity to uh, visit all of our schools. And what I see are just incredible children who deserve our very best. I see a, a, a staff, a faculty, teachers, and support personnel that are just working as hard as anyone can ask anyone to, to work. I see principals that are providing the type of leadership that um, that teachers want, principals need, and parents want their, their children to have. <clears throat> and so all that to say that with all the noise, good things are happening out there in schools for kids, and, and that's where it's important. That's where it needs to happen, and we'll continue to keep our focus there. Um, I've got an awful lot of information for you here, and I'm going to slip through this quickly. <coughs> Excuse me, I think Tori put in front of you water. 
maybe in a few minutes. <laughs> I hope I'm not going to be that long. Uh, Tori put in front of you kind of a talking points on each slide, and, and I'm just going to hit on these real quickly, and then I want to get to um, what we've done to put ourselves in a position to ask what we're asking, so you have an, an understanding of that. Uh, the state has projected a decline in enrollment, and uh, I reached out to them, don't understand why. They explained it was on the first two months last year. Adjustments will be made if there's a significant growth, but that kind of starts us off a little bit behind the eight ball that we weren't uh, anticipating. Um, just heard Commissioner Thompson, I believe, talk about the importance of fund balance. We started the year with a $102,000 fund balance, which is, is nothing. We have as much of life as we do. Um, we actually used our fund balance the, the last two years. We used 3.5 fund balance in 21-22. We used 3.5 fund balance in 22-23, which left us with $106,000 again, which is, is virtually nothing. This year, we used extra money to um, kind of fill some holes. Um, but that leaves us with a, a budget deficit uh, of 3.5 even after what I'm asking. And I'll be happy to respond to questions later on about how we got there, basically what I'm concerned with is uh, how we're gonna get out of there, and I think we're gonna get out of there and, and do well. And you know, let me say one other thing about uh, about my being here and, and why I'm here. You know, I spent four years here from 14 to 18, and I, I view this as a, a very special place. Uh, had a, a good relationship with the commissioners, had a good relationship with Ms. York's uh, predecessors. Uh, we've met a couple times and have had some, some good conversations. And I think we did some, some good work in, in those four years and when we left in, in 2018. But if you'll recall, those who are paying attention, in 2014 we had some real challenges. We were in pretty rough shape. And I came before you guys and women, I guess it was, no it was guys and women at that time, and, and had a pretty big ask and you, you stepped to the plate. And, and that ask was built around the vision that, that this community had adopted at the time. And I remember sharing with the, the board um, what it would take to implement that vision. And, and I said, you know, we can't ask you for that in one year, but we can set a plan to implement this over six to eight years. And uh, you got us off to a good start. Uh, did well the second year, did well the third year, did well the fourth year. Not quite as well, but still did well. And so my relationship and with, with the, this board of commissioners has been, been very positive. And so here I am, uh, 10 years after that 2014, and I come to you again with a pretty big ask. Uh, and I come to, to you again when we're uh, kind of in a, in, a, in a rough situation. As rough of a situation where, again, I, I don't want to lose sight of, of good things that are happening out there in our, in our schools for our, our kids. So how are we gonna get back on track where we can really move forward? We found that um, we have not been following the state allocation allotment for positions as closely as we maybe could have. Um, and, and that happens in, in all school systems over time, but it, but it needs to be reined in. And we're going to be able to uh, kind of scale back, save a lot of money on, on, on positions that we're eliminating and, and cutting, and, and help us get there. We've also, and uh, our team has, has worked diligently the last two months, um, moved money around, if you will, uh, relied on extra money, to fill holes that we, we would have had. And, and one of the things I'm gonna to present to you is a continuation budget, and, and Ms. York and I were talking yesterday, and I said, continuation is, is, is kind of a misnomer in, in, in some sense, because we're not continuing what, we're, what we've been doing. We're, we're cutting seven and a half million dollars, but kind of to maintain uh, any semblance of stability for our schools and our kids, um, this is what we're, we're asking you for. Uh, that, Allocation that I just mentioned to you, this is what the, the state, how the state allocates uh, teachers based on the number of students. Unfortunately, students don't come in neat little packages of 18 <laughs> or little packages of, of 23. So we have variance from place to place. And the way we handle that is using other sorts of funds, local funds, to hire an extra teacher, creating combination classes, which is not I ideal. Um, and it's more difficult in our, in our smaller schools where you don't have an economy of scale. So what we've done as we've gone through this budget process is we've gotten much tighter with regards to using this. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go through all these, but these are just the sources of funds that we get from the state. I, I do want to point out, um, again, we get money for teachers, we get money for instructional support, we get money for school 
building administration. Assistant principals come based on months of employment. So every 985 students, we get one assistant principal, one month of employment. That gives us 22 and a half, 10 month positions. We have 37 schools. So a lot of our local money goes into assistant principals. Um, that job has become increasingly difficult and our principals need assistant principals. With testing, with everything that goes on, with all reporting, everything they have to do, even at our smallest schools, they, they, it's very, very difficult to do with themselves. At our middle schools with seven, 800 students, at our high school with um, 1,100, 1,200 students. Um, school health personnel, that includes nurses, counselors, and, and the like. Instructional support, we can get counselors out of that money as well. Again, we're allowed 53 positions um, in, in that area. We, we simply need more. Uh, transportation, we get five and a half million dollars there. I, I love this one. Uh, in the instructional supplies, $686,000. That, that, that's $31 per child. That's what we get from the state for uh, instructional, $31 per child. So I've got some real, I've got more issues with the state than I do with our county commissioners, but this is just to kind of provide some context of, of why we're asking you, uh, what we're asking you for. At risk funds, um, this takes care of SROs, uh, anything, any type of support that would provide our, our students who fall into those categories that would be considered at risk. We get SROs, um, we get $420,000 from the state for SROs. <coughs> um, that would take care of our high schools, no middle schools, no elementary schools. Um, we're spending $3 million of local dollars on, on SROs. And I mean, in, in today's environment, in, in our rural schools, our SROs are probably more about keeping the bad people out than being concerned with what's going on in, inside our, our schools. Um, again, a couple other areas, textbook $690,000. I, I don't know if you can get a chemistry book for less than $100. So you divide that by 22,000 kids. Well, not all taking chemistry, but the textbooks are, are expensive. A um, couple of other state allotments, uh, Children with Disabilities, the Public Law 94-142 was passed in 1975, that's IDEA. There's a promise of federal funding and we're not even at 15% uh, of federal dollars. That falls on the state, uh, falls on the state pretty much as deaf ears. A lot of that comes back to, uh, to you guys. So, how are we going to address this? And this is on, uh, on the document to give you a little more um, explanation. We're cutting a half a million dollars out of central services positions. Uh, we have a, an elementary director, a middle school director, and a high school director. We're going to have one director next year uh, to retire. So one of the things that we've been fortunate about, we're large, large enough that we have a little bit of an economy of scale, and that all of these positions that we're eliminating were vacant positions. The, the only people being harmed financially on this would be people losing some months of employment as we, we kind of scale things. So we're cutting back um, a lead nurse, going from two leads to one, cutting back some people in exceptional children, cut back an executive director of human resources, we've cut a um, position in technology, and we've cut a number of central services positions from 12 months employment to 10 months employment. Um, school instructional specialists, there are 38 of these. And it's, it's, I used to call them academic coaches when I was here before. Um, they provide support to our teachers. We have a lot of beginning teachers that need additional support. They provide support to principals. Um, we have this multi-tiered system of support that we're required to work, which we're required to implement, which requires uh, a lot of work and a lot of time, a lot of paperwork. They've been taking the lead on that. We have, um, we, we try to have our, our teachers working in professional learning communities where they're planning together. Somebody needs to help facilitate that. It's been these people. They're really important people. When we started this budget process, I told the team, instructional support specials are untouchable. We're not gonna, we're not gonna touch this. We'll help you touch them. Uh, they're all going back in the classroom. Cut two and a half million dollars there. Principal and system principal alignment. Um, again, we, we've scaled back to a, um, a more consistent alignment of uh, numbers of assistant principals. Um, we've actually cut some since this uh, 
document. I think it's closer to $900,000 savings on that. I think our high schools are going to be down to two assistant principals. Our middle schools will have two assistant principals. All of our elementary schools will have one, with the exception of four of our schools, which will be, be sharing at half time. I think Pleasant Grove and Sylvan and BEJ and Street. And Ray Street. And Ray Street. Um, so that, that was a half a million dollars. And, and again, let me also say that I'm well into my 15 minutes. Um, these are really, really difficult cuts. And I, I think two of my toughest days. In, in 23 years as a superintendent, and, and I was actually chairman of the state board during uh, 2009 when the, when the Great Recession kicked in, and, and dealt with budgets then. And so 23 years, four years responsible for a budget at the state level, I've, I've never had a budget that was as difficult as this one. And so probably uh, my, my, my three toughest days were Wednesday of that week when I shared with the principals what we were doing, Thursday of that week when I shared with all the people that were being affected, I brought all these instructional specialists in together over at Ray Street, not Ray Street, over at CTEC, talked with them, brought other people affected in as I talked with them, and told them what we're doing. And it was just really difficult. And the other tough day was on Friday when I presented it to the, uh, to the board. Um, and the board had a lot of really good questions for me. And uh, I said, there's not a thing on here that I feel comfortable cutting, but we, we had to uh, to do something. Uh, media specialists, librarians, um, we cut back seven positions. We're going to have our high schools and our middle schools share uh, a media specialist. It's uh, more doable at some schools where we're sharing a campus than, than others. There's other seven will go back in into the classroom. Um, Non-teaching positions, we, uh, our, our instructional specialists, in addition to cutting those positions, they were all 11 month employees, so we saved a month of employment on, on that as well. Um, student services position, these are our nurses, counselors, social. and social workers, I'm, I'm sorry. We've um, cut positions in, in each of those. And again, I, I see Commissioner Thompson doesn't like that one. Um, because of her interest in, in all kids, but particularly kids who uh, need special support, need special services, so we're scaling back on, on that side. Um, we have guidance assistants in our, in our middle schools. We're cutting those completely out. They're half-time positions, plus we're going from two guidance counselors in our middle schools to, to one. Um, we've reduced um, our elementary specialty programs, the, the Leader in Me, which we've seen that program really transform some, some schools, and the A-plus, which is a cultural arts program, we, we canceled those. Most of those programs started between 2014 and 2018, when uh, I was superintendent implementing those programs, we were really proud of those, and that was part of our strategic plan. And then um, the benefits that are associated with all these Positions is about a million dollars. So we've cut seven and a half million dollars to, to get to, to where we are. Our recommendation, salary increase, the state is legislating, um, we think is 3%, that's three quarters of a million dollars. Retirement increase and health insurance, again, these are things imposed upon us by the General Assembly that, that we have to pay on, on, on the supplement, on locally paid people. Uh, all people with the, the insurance, that's um, half a million dollars. Utility increase is, is $4,000, four, I wish it was $4,000, it's $4 million. Step increase, uh, classified salary positions is about $50,000. And increase in, in charter schools is about $700,000. We have to, uh, about 10% of the eligible school age children in Alabama go to charter schools. So. From our, we have to pay a per child, whatever our per child allotment from you guys. It is needs to go to that charter school. It's about 10%, so we we'll build a budget. We said take 10%. Plus, it's a little bit higher because this year we're in the hole with charter schools. We had a few more students in charter schools than we anticipated. Um, technology support and equipment, 14, $1.4 million. Operational increases. $1.4 million and the Alabama Virtual School about a half a million dollars. 
on PowerPoint, I, I can, I, I, I'll wait because I noticed it. It have to be a question. It's about where the dollars go, and that's what this link is. So let me run through a couple, and I'll get back to that, and, uh, and then to your question. So where that leaves us is those items that were uh, legislated by the General Assembly, almost one and a half million dollars. That step increase is, is five hundred and employee compensation, five hundred fifty thousand dollars. The operation and technology services, which was the last slide I just showed you, is just shy of seven million dollars for a total of eight point seven million dollars to for us to continue as no, so it's a continuation budget minus that seven point five million dollars. If that makes any sense. And then when we looked at the total and the ten percent of that, that's one point five. Uh, million dollars that goes to charter schools. So our total ask um, is $10.3 million. And when folks think that money follows the kids, the charter schools, this um, is a $10 million ask for us, but only uh, eight and a half million comes to us. The rest of it goes down where we'll kind of pass through. So that's, um, I must not hit my button because I have no idea. I put on. I put my time on an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Tori's laughing, but she's mad. <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's what I want to ask, uh, what we are asking. Um, I know it's a, it's a huge ask. Uh, I, think, I think that's his dessert. I can assure you that come July 1st, we're going to be on, uh, on solid ground with regards to our uh, to our budget. Uh, I think we've learned some some lessons over the years that we can monitor some things um, a little more carefully. Um, we um, you know, I'll be happy to we'll be happy to do that. We'll respond to any questions and services you might have. Um, yeah, why don't we see what questions we have? That and and Heidi or was your do they have that electronically? You, did you send that to them? Uh, the links that you had sent me, yeah. I did send it to them. But okay. like we talked about yesterday, we're having trouble opening those on the county network, so I'm not certain everyone has been able to access them so okay. we have printed hard copies okay. that we can distribute. Okay good so you have printed hard copies of the breakdowns of, uh, of the numbers? We do too. It's on okay. I think it's the last couple of pages of what was passed out this morning. I guess I should look at my handout shouldn't I? I think that's what you're referring to. I think is this a fresh version, Dr. Harrison, of the links that you had emailed? That should be the same version as the links we emailed. Okay. Yeah. So we do have that at our seats. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what you have in front of you then is um, a breakdown of the um, utilities and, and how we got to that $4 million figure. We have a breakdown of what we're asking for with the technology support and equipment replacement and how we got to the 1.4 and then the operational increase and preventive maintenance and how we got to the 1.4. Okay. Um, concerns about um, the lowering numbers of assistant principals. It scares me to think of Williams High School having an, a principal and assistant principal. Williams is like a castle. Is that all, is it, that's what you're telling me? They'll have two assistant principals. So you'll have a total of three administrators. That's still. Um, I just know 
how important those APs are. They do so much. I mean, staff is, is, is important. And <laughs> then the student services is another whole ball game. Um, we, I know everything's about money, but I look at it as about kids and the ones who teach them. And um, I, it's a broken record. We, if we could just help what children walk out of into the school system, it would it would be such a difference. But um, I just know the role that social workers play. I know the roles they play at DSS. We're short there. It shows up. It does show up in things out, called outcomes, evidence based. You know, we're doing grants and stuff like that. And I know the roles of these student services. I know how important McKinney Vento is. I know how I know how important all these things are for kids who just have a, a train wreck to live in sometimes, and, um, and that gets on them, and sometimes that affects them, and that affects your halls and your classrooms. Um, you can't, you just can't pay it out of people, but you've got to have the resources. Um, I'm big concerned about the shapes of the buildings. I, I, I'm all about that because. Um, when you walk into something, it, it really sets a first impression on how you are felt about when you go there to that building. Teacher, student, whatever. And I have big issues about custodial things. Um, always have been. And, um, but I just, I don't really have any questions, Dr. Harrison. I've been this road with you before. And it's always, um, it's always what we can, what are we going to have to do without? What do I have to do without? When you do without, it shows up. It does show up. I just want the best for our children. I think they deserve it. And I want the best environment for our teachers. Because um, they create the world. They just do. And when we start realizing that, we'll do better by them. So, I think you pretty much know what I said. <laughs> I'm done. Mr. Lashley. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I'm going to walk through a couple of things that were in your presentation. Um, I want to go back to your slide when you were showing me how many students you have per teachers. First of all, I'd like to know the, the total number of teachers that you currently have in your system. I, mean, I don't need a roundabout number. I need something that's pretty close to what we're looking for. Like, how many teachers do you have? Mm -hmm. You mentioned a 22,000 teacher number? Can we get a little more precise? No, 42,000 students. Excuse me. I'm sorry. 985 teachers. Excuse me. Is that the number that I... That's the slide I want to look at. It says 995. That's my mistake. Uh, the reason why I want to go to this slide is are the numbers at the top, it's one teacher per 19 students. Is that the ratio that I'm looking at? Kin kindergarten, the, the, the chart on your left, mm -hmm. kindergarten, they a lot 1 to 18, mm -hmm. first grade 1 to 16, second, third grade 1 to 17, right. so forth. Uh, can you tell me what the, what the ratio is in your whole system from K through 12? What is the uh, per teacher, per student allotment? We, we are only allowed to go over about three students when we do that and we have to turn in our numbers twice during the year in order for the superintendent to get paid. So generally it's about three up. In some of our classrooms, we are allowed to submit a waiver which allows us to go above what the state says we can have, but that is in situations like some of our honors, our AP courses, as well as our dual language courses. Um, so it just depends on what grade and what what programs are in schools. Yeah. Well, but I guess I guess the reason why I'm asking this question is because if you could narrow it down, you could probably figure out exactly how many teachers you're going to need, um, and that's just how I'm looking at it. Um, I inadvertently put 22 because I was doing like maybe a 10 percent increase. Like I said, 19 19 students per teacher. I made it 22. So apparently, I'm low. 22? Well, minutes. we could do uh, 22 in some of the classrooms, but like in kindergarten, we could only have up to 21, unless it's a dual language class, then we could, uh, we could go above that. 
What this is, we actually have more teachers than what is here. The state will only fund us 995 teachers based on the, uh, the allotment sure. they gave us. So if you go back to the previous slide with our numbers, the state funded us this year off of 22,185 kids, which is 581 less students than what they funded us for this year. Well, the reason I asked that question um, is because if you are looking at those total number of teachers and you say that you have 581 less students than last year, you could divide that number into 581 and the, what I got is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 classes that you're not going to need this year. 25 classes that you're not going to need this year. Well, we can't, unfortunately it doesn't work as neatly as that because again, the state says that in the K-8s, this is what you can do. And then high school is different because high school classes are based on registration with kids. So, you know, we, we, don't, we don't make classes, let's say only five kids register for AP Calculus, then we find a different way to serve those five kids because we can't afford with the limited number of teachers to have a class of five. Sure. So we sometimes pair up classes or we may do um, the North Carolina virtual school to, to serve those kids with that. So at the high school level, you may have a biology class of 31, but your English one class may only have 22, um, depending on honors levels classes are usually higher. But with our kids who struggle, sometimes those numbers are lower. We also have to take into account that this also includes our special needs kids who may be in an adapted curriculum class. So that's not necessarily those teachers are counted in there because, and those classes are smaller. Like I think the most we put in a class is 13. Um, but those are our most severe need kids. And they're also included in the enrollment piece of it. Um, we did question the enrollment piece just because we've seen our, what our enrollment's been doing and especially with some of the refugee and other kids that are moving into the county. Um, unfortunately, the state has said after the first 15 days, if our allotment is higher, then we may get more additional slots as well as money, but it will be closer to October before we'll get that. So at this point, Anything we've done with allotments, like you said, we used the state's formula when we allotted out teachers this year. But what we've done is we've tried to stick to that as much as possible because we don't know if we'll get additional funding. And if we do, then we could maybe make some class sizes lower. And Mr. Ashley, we will see that reduction in teachers for what the state gives us. So instead of us getting those teachers based on the 22,766, they'll give us teachers based on 22,185. So that would be where that 581 you were talking about comes into play. Gotcha. And, and we, uh, I think, Ms. Johnson articulated well. Absolutely. Uh, well, the reason I ask is uh, you mentioned in your presentation that um, the state has given you a 3% increase in your teacher salaries. Correct. Well, projected. Projected. Yep. I actually think it's going to be more, but I've been wrong before. Uh, the reason I ask is, and Miss Evans may have to step in here to. Uh, I'm under I'm under the impression that the teacher supplement is between eleven and a half and fourteen and a half percent. Is that correct? I think that is correct. Eleven and a half being on the low side, and as we work our way up to assistant principals, fourteen and a half. Now the reason I point this out to you is because um, we pay assistant principals a little bit, well I should say a lot more than we pay teachers, but the assistant principals and the principals get the majority of the teacher supplement. And the reason I say majority is because they're up at the 14.5% number. They're not down to 11.5%, although I think they should be. And also another thing, a teacher, I mean a principal should not get a supplement if their school uh, is in shambles. They shouldn't get any bonus. Uh, nobody in the private sector would get a bonus for having that. And the reason I say that is, is if the state is going to give you 3% increase in salaries, that automatically, I just did my math, that automatically is an increase from the, uh, from the Alamance County taxpayer of 0.345%. That, it's an automatic 
So that's why I ask you how many teachers you had, because you can figure out how much that would be, how much the automatic increase would be to your $1.4 million. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Yes. Okay. Uh, the reason I asked that question is the same thing happened last year. I don't, you know, I can't, you know, I can't remember the exact percentage increase the teachers got, but I do know as far as Alamance County taxpayers are concerned that that's an automatic increase. If you go up, our, our supplement increases by, uh, by at least 10%. When I say 10% of what you actually allocated. That's why I wanted to focus on this because I think your 1.4 number for teacher supplement is high based on the numbers I just gave you. I think it's going to be high. I think it's it's, it's high. It's going to be high. Your 1.4 million dollar number is high. I'm just going to say that. And we can sit down and talk about that at a later time, maybe when I'm in a little better shape. Um, <laughs> but that's just the only thing, two things I wanted to point out to you, that um, the, the, the students, the allocation that you're having to pay the charter schools, um, how do I say this? The allocation you make to the charter schools is an allocation that you have no control over. It just depends on how many students roll over into that. Correct. And I'm, I'm looking right here, 581. I'm just taking that as a barometer. I know it could be less, could, no, it could be more. But I just want to point those out to you that the, the teacher supplement number that you have is high. I'm just going to say that. Now, I want to roll down to the virtual school, and I'll shut up. Let, let, me, let me back up on a few yes, seconds sir. before you get off that. Where are you getting the $1.4 million? On your presentation. It's on the summary request. On oh, the summary request? Where that, we added all of those things together. Okay, it's where we're adding those things together. The, the salary increase, is that 3%, the 755 that I have there? Mm -hmm. That's factored in what you were just talking about. Okay. So, okay, thank you. And I think the principal's supplement schedule is different than the teacher's supplement schedule. Is it, is it lower than 11? Would a, would a principal and assistant principal get less than 11.5%? Something it, like that? No, they, they, they do get a little bit more of a supplement, um, but understand, especially at the middle and high level, they're working seven days a week till 11 o'clock at night, sure. so it's not really a bonus, it's a supplement sure. on top of what they're doing. Um, so I just want to make sure that's clear, but you know, adding those together, and the governor has obviously recommended a higher um, increase for a raise for public school employees but when we talked to, to Heidi earlier, we just said we were going to leave it at 3%. If so, for some reason it goes up, um, we'll have to deal with that when it happens. But we wanted to keep it at what we felt like they had promised in the biennial budget that they had originally done. Because we got 4% this year and it was supposed to be 3 this coming year. But we'll see what happens. I thought it was going to be seven, about 7. Yeah, they yeah. said it was 7, seven divided over two, over two years. Yeah, 7 over two years. And our 4% was this year. Next year is supposed to be 3. We'll see if something happens different. Well, I just wanted to point out that, that everyone should know problem. that when that increase happens, our supplement to the teachers automatically go up. So I just want to make that. percentage. Right. And it's, so that's, I know the staff has taken a look at it. Uh, but just wanted everyone to know that that is how it works. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll be quiet, is your virtual school. Uh, I heard from a school board member that the virtual school is going to cost a half a million dollars. Uh, I, I think that number is um, not accurate uh, because there are several things that go into making that number what it is. Now, the reason I even say that is, is I talked to the Department of Public Edu Instruction in Raleigh about this specific thing because it was my understanding that anybody who wanted to go to a virtual school, all I had to do was pick up the phone and call DPI and you're in. That's not necessarily accurate. Uh, they have a particular amount of people that they can take. Now I know there's a, no a new group in Asheville who's come online who will take the allotment that you are giving to the virtual school folks. and. Everyone can, now they have made up, everyone can come. Now the reason I even say that is, is I don't think that Alamance County taxpayers should have to pay for the virtual school if it's offered by DPI. 
but we know that they don't have enough folks to, to, to fit in that building. But we do realize there's other people coming online that will actually facilitate the people that actually want to go to the virtual school. And I think that the people who are currently in virtual school, and I do have a question from Ms. Johnson about how many people currently are enrolled in Alamance County virtual school system. Uh, I think it's roughly 212. 210, 210. Okay, so I'm close. Okay. Uh, you just take that 210 and divide it into 500,000, that gives you how much it's costing each, each uh, for, for us to put them in. And I think that's going to be very close to the number that DPI is giving me, around $2,500. I just didn't want to be paying for something that the state provides. And I know $500,000 isn't much in a budget of $59 million, but it's something. Uh, that $500,000, in my personal opinion, will take care of your teacher supplement as an automatic increase. Now, I may be off a little bit, but I think you're going to get close to that. Uh, that's the only three things I wanted to, to point out, and uh, I know I'd definitely like to sit down with you and your staff at some point before June 3rd. I know it's very soon. We'll do it. Uh, I, I've been out of commission for a little bit, and I'm trying to get my legs underneath me, but I'm focusing on these three. Or, or, there's four things, but I didn't want to bring the fourth thing up because I don't have enough information. But I do know that um, I definitely would like to... Uh, sit down and work with your budget because I know it shocked a lot of folks when they read in the newspaper 27% increase in your budget. Shocked a lot of folks and my phone rang off the hook for days. <laughs> and only only saving grace there is I got shipped off to the hospital so I didn't have to <laughs> answer all those phone calls. But I just wanted to let you know that you know I'm looking at these kind of things yeah. and how we can sort of like help you with with what you're looking at. Appreciate that. Let, let me respond quickly to, yes, the, to the virtual piece. That a lot more money than $500,000 is being spent on the virtual school. Okay? The, the principal is paid for by the state. Teachers are provided are paid for by the state. We use that same funding formula. Now, it, initially, I think when we first started working on this, we had about $2.4 million in there for the virtual school. But as we look closely, we saw that we had two art teachers. We saw that we had two music teachers. We saw that we had two PE teachers. And, and so we went back to that strict formula, and we cut that back we almost in half, plus we eliminated fourth and fifth grade. And so that's where the 500,000 would be for uh, technology, hotspots, uh, things of, of that nature. The virtual public school carries a cost to, to the school system. So it's advertised as free to kids, and it is free to kids. But and, and the virtual public school actually started in Cumberland County when I was superintendent there. It became a state virtual public school when I was chairman of the state board. And, and so I, I know well how, how that operates. So you've got that limited numbers, plus there is a cost of the locals. The private providers operate kind of like a charter school. So if we were to take those 200 children and work with a private school, off the top of our budget, that five, that that figure will go down that figure will go down 200 students so when it goes down 200 students thinking about ten thousand dollars per child roughly that would be two million dollars comes from the state and goes right to that that school so if we don't see it but we lose um, there's children and the money that comes with it. Now, of that $10,000, uh, a lot of that money goes towards other, other than just teaching and learning. Um, it can go towards supplies and materials, co-curricular activities, um, some of the building repairs. So a lot of things that a virtual school doesn't have to pay for comes out of that. Then, and one private provider that I talked with they said they would give us 5% back for administrative cost. Of that, that was Stride, wasn't it? It was Stride, yes. And, and we had a good conversation, and it, and it might be something we might want to consider partnering with somewhere down the road. But I think that the, using them as a charter school would cause us more harm than anybody good, anything good. And then the, the other piece of that, we would have to take those 200 kids and pay that local piece. So that local charter school that we increased $700,000 this year, that would go up 
by whatever our local per whatever our local expenditure is times 200. So it would be, you know, I, I think really the cost would be would be greater. And then the last thing, um, our virtual school is, is truly a school. It's they they created a school culture over there. It's it's really a school without walls. It's not a a content provider. And um, I, I, I I think it's a pretty decent bang for the buck. Bill. Yeah, go ahead. I'll finish. Um, Thank you, sir. I've been curious about this for a while. Wow. If you if you offer a charter school that is, or excuse me, a virtual school that is K through twelve, right? You, you would have. It's not. Ours is not. Okay. Ours was four through twelve, and now we're going to become six through twelve. Six. So you okay? So there isn't anything feeding into four through four and five. That's why right. I got it. Now, it didn't make sense to me. I was thinking K through twelve, and you could have all these people that would just be skipped when they missed four and five. Okay. okay, that was one question. The other one was um, on your chart uh, about the seven hundred thousand for charter schools. Uh, that one, the, I think it's the next chart, or the next one. Then you had another million five hundred thousand going to charter schools. So is that two million? No, that seven hundred thousand is in there. That that's the total that um, we'd be playing charter schools. This is our. Okay, what's the 700,000? Oh, that's the growth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I suggest that we take a five minute break. Oh. Give Mr. Turner a chance to come back. See if we can just hold on for five minutes. I can move closer. Yeah. Back again, the front row is calling the that's when you get the job to get down. Mr. Horner wants to know if he can continue his interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Um, as we all know, we've had some difficulties with financials over the last year, year or so. And I think this board feels like it probably needs to get a deeper dive into what's going on financially at ABSS. Um, part of our responsibility is to make sure that the bills of the county are paid. But we can't have a school. We don't want necessarily to have ABSS cutting off HVAC to avoid HVAC or electric bills and have more mold. But at the same time, we need to get a solid indication of what those bills have looked like and what we, a, a real good estimate of what they're going to look like and how we reach a number like $4 million. I mean, that's a big chunk for $4 million. That is a big chunk, and that's a good chunk. And, and that probably extends to some of the rest of the budget as well. I mean, we've got a real abbreviation. The, the, the information we got from ABSS was rather abbreviated compared to what we get from the community college, from the sheriff's office, from the other departments. Um, we get details. Uh, our, our staff does, and they prepare those details so that we can read through them. But Bill and I are used to financial details. I mean, I've spent 35 years doing finance, so I don't mind looking at details. And details help me absorb and understand why we need what we need. It's kind of hard for me to tell my constituents that, yeah, we're going to increase the tax rate uh, two and a half cents just for two utilities, roughly, for $4 million. Um, I'm just rounding that off the top of my head, but two and a half million dollars per penny and uh, $4 million is what it is. And One and a half cents. That's good. I um, I apologize for not satisfying the need for details. Um, you're always in trouble when you assume. 
and I assume like your mind might be off. That's by design, I think. <laughs> and, and I assumed that I, I simply submitted the type of budget we did when I was here before, so I should have checked with Ms. York and said, what level of details do you, do you want? So we're prepared to provide details. And I want to ask Mr. Hook to come up and, and address specifically the, um, the utilities, and, and because I anticipated that coming. And, and also these other increases, you've got that spreadsheet, but we're gonna let him put it up and then let uh, Mr. Hook, if he, as if he has a choice, <laughs> let him come up here and say. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Um, in the, the packet of printed materials that uh, Ms. Short provided, I have a, uh, some information on the utility bills. Uh, Mr. Carter referenced to your questions. Okay. Um, what makes it really difficult for especially for electric but also for, for gas and uh, I want to point out we we deal with Duke Power, we deal with Piedmont Natural Gas, we deal with Dominion uh, Natural Gas, we deal with Amerigas because of the sites we have uh, propane right. uh, near the gas lines. Plus we have water bills in all sorts of jurisdictions municipalities sorry so uh, but what made it really difficult what made it really difficult uh, oh, to calculate thank you um, is um, for 16 years prior to uh, the mold situation uh, the air condition and the heat was turned off at five o'clock every day and it came on again at about six o'clock the next morning. And if you think about that, that right there is 100% increase, more or less. Um, and then the other situation here in the summer when the schools are working on four day work weeks, it was totally turned off on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So uh, we have and no- That cost is $27 million. Exactly, it sure did. So, uh, when uh, the situation occurred um, in early to mid-August, we had discussions in, in the joint meetings and we all agreed, turn it on and, and let it run to prevent this sort of thing from happening. Um, but we don't have any historic bills, invoices, that would show us what it takes to run, run the air condition around the clock through, through the summer. Uh, or, or anywhere across the year. And then the same can be said uh, with, with gas bills and so on. Uh, in addition to that, and, and you all know, um, uh, the system neglected to uh, forecast an increase based on the new high school, which is a Dominion, uh, Dominion gas bill, and it's a Duke, a Duke energy bill, uh, and it's in the Swepsonville area for, for water. So that wasn't, we have no historic records for that. Um, so that kind of illustrates how it's difficult. So what I did to try to come up with an estimate, um, and my, my estimate is that uh, we'll, we'll see an increase just generally for all utilities, that would include water. I don't forecast any increases in water, although I know uh, Ms. Rollins indicated that some municipalities had increased water and sewer rates. Um, but uh, just based on where we were, and where we're going to be, uh, I think we're going to be up 80 per, 80%, 82% on our, on our cost for, um, for utilities. The big ones being electric and then, and then gas to some degree. Um, so what I had to do to, to try to do this estimate, if you think about last July, last July we were turning the air condition off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, every day at 5 o'clock. So the July bills from last year are not a good indicator of where we'll be this July. Um, so once we got all the air conditions running uh, around the clock, uh, I, I think the most valid um, month of invoices we would have would be for the month of September, which show on uh, these little figures that I have here as, as October, because that's when those were received. So I think that month shows around $392,000 to try to look on here for uh, the numbers that I have. 392,000 at the bottom of that page with the, uh, the figures, 
Uh, I think that's, a, to me, a reasonable number to use for a hot month. I have no other month figures to use for hot months. So the way I tried to do this, this math to put together a forecasted budget is I took the, the invoices that we had for uh, electricity for new power for uh, September and I applied those for what I would think are all the hot months. And you can see how I stacked them in to that calculation there at the bottom of that page. I just used 392,000 for what I saw as hot months. We had an accurate invoice for uh, new power for November and for December. Uh, I felt like we had uh, a mild January and February, but we have had some cold Januaries and Februarys in the past. So I put down 400,000 uh, for, for January and February, not knowing whether we'd have a hot or cold uh, month. So that's how I went about doing doing that math. And you can see the, the numbers and the way I calculated. In the middle of this page that I'm referencing, you can see that um, uh, I've got a number that I'm using as an estimate because I, that, that's all that I can do. And that number is $6 million. Um, so I, I have the, the prior year's budget. I've done the difference there. The difference between what I forecast and what the, the prior year's budget was is uh, $2.7 million. And then I have suggested contingencies because what I've learned is you never know what tomorrow holds. So I have a suggested contingency amount of 10% of the total $6 million or 20%. That's because we don't know what the weather will be. The other pieces that we have too, we through the ESSER projects, uh, we've installed new chillers in places we didn't have chillers before, particularly with the Williams Gym, the AO Gym, the Western Middle Gym. That will be an added cost that we, we do not know what that will be. Um, then the other um, side of the coin, you've heard us talk about four pipe systems uh, in ongoing conversations where we're able to run boilers and chillers simultaneously for the purpose of doing some dehumidification. Uh, we have those systems in place and a lot more will be in place through uh, the ESSER projects. I have no way to forecast what that, what that cost will be. We did that a little last year at SeaTech after uh, the mold situation and immediately the finance department started calling the operations and said, hey, you must have a gas leak at SeaTech. We have a bill for 900, uh, uh, $900 for natural gas. We never had a bill for natural gas at SeaTech. And we called maintenance and said, we can check out. And it turns out the HVAC controls text, well, you, you told me to dehumidify, that's what I'm doing. So at certain times of the day, at peak times of humidity, that's what he was doing. Uh, so we don't have a way to forecast that. I certainly understand you, you need accurate figures to budget. We do too. Uh, we do too. We just don't, we don't have them. And I, I was thinking when uh, uh, Andrew Rollins was speaking, she referenced the price increases for, for energy. And she referenced water and sewer, but she also mentioned uh, electric. I mean, across the board, I think that's the way it's gonna be. I didn't take any inflation figures in here. I just tried to use what I thought were accurate numbers for hot months and cold months, and months where we had some somewhat accurate figures. So I did this, calculation but you know earlier because we had to get numbers uh, for the budget but like what I did is I, I knew the November figure was exact we didn't have our bills for March yet I used the November number for March because I figured November March are pretty similar mm -hmm. that's about as good as I could do okay so I, got I, a swag I instead of a wag right <laughs> sir got a swag instead of a wag I, I suppose what? so so I hope that answers questions around no. around utility and utility forecasting. All I know is we have to be ready and have money to make pay bills. The swag stands for sophisticated. Mr. Something Um Mr. Rook, I'm looking at the um the is I think we're looking at the same document, proposed operations budget with the water and the natural gas and the electric all on the same page. Is that what this is? Yes, sir. There it is. Yes, that's the page I've been speaking to. Okay. Yeah, I just want to Look at this a little bit. Sure. Um, so the, the looks like pretty wild swings in water. Um, are you able to understand, like particularly Burlington, it goes what down else? 50k? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I don't know. And what I did there um, is uh, 
water is the only place that I can tell you what it was the year before accurately. Um, and so what I did is I had the 22-23 water rates and the 23-24 estimates, and I don't have complete 23-24 information. So what I did for the estimate is I took the higher number of the two versus 22-23 or 22-324. Uh, so in particular, the Burlington one, I think it says 111. Um, my eyes are not really able to focus here, but 111 I think is the high number for Burlington. And I moved that over to the, to the estimate. I can't say, you know, I wasn't in the department at that time if there was a water leak or something else, but we have irrigation, <coughs> irrigation during hot summers. You have different things that go on um, in, the, in the schools during, uh, during the year. I can't speak to why it was um, near about double from Burlington, but that seems to be the one that was, that was off base. Uh, Commissioner Turner? Yeah. Uh, the city of Burlington has a unique way of raising their water rates each and every year, <laughs> about 10%. No, it's fine. And that Graham is jumping on that bandwagon too, mm -hmm. which is a travesty because we have the second most water in the state. Water is a commodity, mm -hmm. and it should be treated as such. So if we have more of something, don't you think you should, the price should go down? But our government officials are actually using that as a way to raise money without having to raise property taxes. And Burlington is the, pr the prime advocate of that. They ain't too shy about property taxes either. Oh, no. Oh, no. In, in summary, Mr. Turner, uh, in the column labeled high estimate, right. that I just wanted to go to the high side where, uh, where we were doing the calculations so I didn't go under it. So that's the highest of the last three years? I only looked at 22, 23, and then the current 23, 24s. I see. But for, for several months, I don't have the, the 23, 24, so I the current ones. Um, a big increase in natural gas dominion is that the new high school? The new high school, that was exactly what that was, Mr. Um, uh, the, the, the obvious big increase is, is Duke Energy. It goes from 2.5 in this budget <coughs> year to an estimate of 4.6 um, this year, and then using that 4.6 number for next year. Um, I'm wondering if uh, those are based upon some assumptions. Uh, this year we ran uh, dehumidifiers probably more than we will next year. I think we'll see some benefits uh, from the some of the new systems put in through the ESSER projects. Um, we have fewer. I mean, we were renting a ton of. Yeah, we were through the during the rental process. We were renting a, a lot more than we probably needed. Um, so uh, we. Uh, we have 300 and some, probably closer to 400, and we have probably about 350 of them deployed in schools and areas and schools that we knew were hot spots as far as humidity from, from last year. And we're gonna keep monitoring that monthly through, through the year to determine do, do we really need them. So for example, at, at Williams and Turntine, um, the systems that are put in there through uh, the ESSA projects, once they're fully running and running correctly, we should be able to dehumidify uh, through the, the, the DOAS, the fresh air systems, in combination with uh, the, the HVAC, the other HVAC uh -huh. systems there. And we, we may not need to run any dehumidifiers, but the dehumidifiers running this year would be less expensive than running them through through what the months we did last year. Mr. let me interrupt there. Are we still renting or do we own them? No, we purchased uh, out of ESRA funds. We had that conversation through our, our, our meetings here, uh, and we found that we could purchase through ESSA funds, so we spent roughly a million dollars to, to, and we keep them dur at the maintenance department during the winter, and then we deploy them in, in April to be ready for when the, the humidity goes up. Thank you, Mr. Rob. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that, that's, that's quite a way, Mr. Chairman. I, I do wonder if we might try to monetize uh, whether we're gonna use dehumidif fewer dehumidifiers and fewer less amounts of time and therefore might benefit by some savings uh, and that number might come down this year. I wonder if we might just take a, take a second to think about that. Um, the, the other issue is uh, when you're, you say you're leaving on, you're leaving on HVACs now when you had them in the past, uh, are you assuming that you're going to leave them at the same temperature 
at night as you're leaving during the day? Um, we went in summer with no no setbacks. Um, from what I've learned in, in, in the winter, we can do some setback temperatures, but we can't do extreme like uh, like you think because it it takes a, a lot of energy to get back up from the lower temperature. So in the winter, we uh, right now we're just running them all the, the same around the clock. But I think the place we could pick up uh, some improvement is in the winter. In the summer, I'm hesitant to uh, to do any temperature setbacks because if the dew point changes in the building, that's that's the problem. So if you leave Broadview on uh, 70 in the day and keep it on 70 at night throughout the summer? Yes. Our, our temperature, we, we aim for 72 to 74. That's what we try to be. And so the number of the six, can you go up first? The column F, the number, the six million, is that adding everything above it in the high estimate? Yes. And then when you subtract last year's or this year's budget of 3.2, you get the 2.79? That's that's right. That that's your estimate. That's the increase that I had. Either one of the two contingencies, the 3.3 number at the bottom would be if we had a 10% contingency for the unexpected. Uh, the 3.9 would be if we had a 20% contingency for the unexpected. Okay. Um, I had some other questions that I, I, I don't know if Dr. Harrison's going to answer, Mr. Harrison, but related to the, uh, the contracts, the increase in the contracts. Yes. And the, the description of um, this, this has got listed 2425 proposed state 015 technology estimate. Is that you? The well, technology was moved into operations department. Um, just, just before I came, so yes, it, it, now it's part of operations. Okay, can you bring that up here? What's this? Oh. Yeah. Oh. All right, so what's, what's the 1.38 number? Uh, that's the number of dollars we need to have in our local budget to fund uh, technology, and that is all the technology for, for the district. That would include uh, all the schools in, in the county. So um, this number, 250000 the state gives us roughly $250,000 a year for technology. So our complete budget for technology that we're forecasting is this 1.6 number. It's at the bottom. We brought that up to the top so you can see the math. If we take out what we think the state's going to give us, uh, 250000 that leaves uh, $1.388 million. Some of the numbers in here, and you can see some of the words we put for the different kinds of software that we have to have to, to run the district. The biggest numbers in here, the largest numbers, um, $415,000 is for uh, laptop replacement for students. Um, going into this year, our oldest student laptop, we use Chromebooks and they're not, you know, they're, they're good for what we're doing, but they're not incredibly durable. This year, 25% of our Chromebooks will be in their fifth year of use. We think that we ought to have a replacement plan, so we're replacing 25% of our student Chromebooks per year. Uh, this $415,000 puts us in a lease for 25% uh, of the Chromebooks to be replaced. And then the next year, that 415 would double to, uh, to 830. So you'd eventually reach uh, uh, a number of, um, I think that's uh, 1.66. Uh, in the fourth year, and then that would be an ongoing lease. But it, that's in contrast to if we were to purchase them, it, the full purchase price would be about 1.7 or 1.66. So you have a lease purchase versus a purchase. Um, and we think a lease is better because some of the repairs and warranties are, are fitted into the lease. So uh, what we like to do is make a plan. We've never had a technology funding plan. Um, and as we talk about the budget and, and having fixed numbers and be able to go forward. Uh, what's happened historically is money's been pulled from other parts of the budget to fund all these things on this list, and that's not a good way to budget. On the software uh, for district student services, that's a $245,000 increase. 
right, is that the, the lease? I'm sorry, that the yeah, the leases on software. No, that gone that, up. That, or that's a yearly a yearly cost, and it's been we've been using uh, different funds like curriculum money to pay for to pay for that figure. So we've just been robbing Peter to pay Paul essentially to to keep this program running. And so what we need to do going forward is to say. Here's the technology budget, just like we have a maintenance budget or a transportation budget, and this is this is what our plan is to, to, to follow. Instead of pulling money out of other departmental buckets, it just cuts it cuts them short. So what I'm trying to do is to get that righted to, to go forward. Well, but this is in your expansion budget request, right? Yes. So if it's already being funded and it wasn't funded here, it was still it's still part of your continuation. Well. Yes and no. It, it, it's ne to me, it's never been something that was budgeted with forethought. It was something that that's, we just said, hey, we got to pay this bill. Where can we take the money instead of having it built into a, a, a budget like we need? Another big ticket item I wanted to, to point out. Um, am I getting bumped off the stage? No, no, no. no I, I think when we look at that $3.5 million fund balance, we look at ESSER money, we were kind of finding money from different sources to pay for this. And my sense is that's what hit into our fund balance. We moved money from point, pot A to pot, pot B. Come uh, come June, it's time to refill pot A, and that's what we're going to fund balance. Exactly. In the absence of fund balance, we have to have a budget for this, this department and for these items. If we have no fund balance, now we have to budget for it. That's, that's the same with the 235 as well? Um, yeah, each of these items are things that, that, that we have to have to run the system to make sure kids are protected online, that we're safe, and do all the sorts of things that our techs need to do to be able to um, take take care of all the computer systems and uh, internet infrastructure that we have. Another item I wanted to uh, point out too, the 425,000 uh, $425, for projected replacement. Uh, Last year I had to push that to the schools, but if you go into to the schools, every classroom has, you hear people talk about smart boards and, and projectors that are mounted to project onto the smart board. Uh, last year we had to have the schools absorb replacement of those out of their budget, which was a terrible hit for, for school budgets because they hadn't planned to do that either. We just didn't have the money to replace them. But based on the age of our projectors in schools, a lot of these were put in back when uh, Dr. Cox was the superintendent. We have some really old uh, projectors in the room which are vital in everyday instruction. So we want to pull that back in and take care of it uh, out, of this, out of this budget instead of put, putting that on individual schools because it, because it is tough, especially for schools that, uh, that don't, don't operate um, to, to maintain funds to, to do that. And it's an unexpected cost. It's not really a capital expense. Well, yes it is, and I'm glad you said that. In some counties, uh, capital for computers, student devices, and teacher devices, and for smart boards would be pushed in, into uh, the capital request, like our right. PAYGO request, but we haven't done that in the past that I know of, so we've got it here as, as on the continuation budget. Um, in the end, it needs, it needs to find its way to some place, but if we pushed it over to PAYGO, then that, it would just push that, that number up. And that would be specifically the about eight hundred thousand dollars the computers and the uh, the projector replacement susan any capital reserve any item that's properly capital could come out of capital reserve the capital reserves that the county had would be for construction not necessarily technology at this time what's the difference um, so you're looking at purchasing equipment versus the upkeep of a building, the facility. We heard that years ago about technology was not that buildings were. Yeah, there is a category of funding we could create that would be operating capital. Other counties right. give money to operating capital for things like technology. So we could go through this line item and pick out the pieces that would qualify for that. Things like staff development would not. Right. It would have to be a piece of equipment that is a one-time expenditure to qualify as, as a capital. 
but we could do that and come up with some options for the board to consider. How about your equipment and software? Software leases and software replacement would right. qualify, yeah. And then what's the 255 to borrow telecommunications network? Is that similar to the 235 and 245? Um, the telecommunications network would be uh, our, our phone systems. We have to do a contract for our voice over internet protocol. Um, and that's, that's where that would be. So that's not a piece of utilities. It's over here in the technology budget. Well, why is that an increase of 255? Why, why do you current? Well, everything on here is, is we've never had a budget within the, the school system for these items. All I'm asking is let's fund the technology budget so that we're not taking from curriculum budgets or from operations budget where these things have just never been designated into, into a budget, Mr. Turner. Okay. Um, the, I don't know where this list is. The list about the, the contract, the increase on the contracts? Yes. We get to that one. Okay. Um, and this uh, this chart that um, Mr. Walker has up on the screen really comes from uh, a prior page. If you um, were to look at the, the first page uh, that I have in the chart, that um, it lists uh, the, this yes this one right here. So. Um, this page is, is the maintenance budget. Uh, so I've listed all the different categories that we have in the maintenance budget. There's one new item category uh, uh, that I, I know that y'all you know, want to discuss, but the current maintenance budget uh, is $10,952,000. That's a set budget in reference to what we just talked about where we didn't have a set budget. This is a set budget that we have. So I've shown what the current budget is and uh, what I would like to see in 24-25, which is $12.3 uh, million. And you can see the increases that I have for each, each line item there, with one of them being a new item of $700,000 that uh, would, would be on the, uh, the next page that uh, Mr. Walker had up previously. It just kind of illustrates all the different service contracts. The reason I put the, 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 the prior page in there with all the types of service contracts that we do is I think people just don't realize the maintenance department doesn't have the capacity to do everything so we have to enter into service contracts to do lots lots of things and that illustrates that and it kind of tells you where the where the figures come from and so I have that line item here um, for uh, service contracts um, on the uh, on the front page but then when you go back to, and, and it shows just an increase of 453, where I've trimmed down some that I think we don't need in order to pick up the $700,000 new one, which I'm suggesting we do HVAC and roof preventative maintenance. We've talked about in the past doing those sorts of things. We just don't have enough staff to be able to hand, handle that for all of our HVAC and roof systems. So I'm suggesting that $700,000 figure. Um, so if you go to the to the last page, yes, that's one of the one Bruce the proposed service contracts. That just illustrates all the things that we have to contract outside, like the hood systems and inspections and repairs. We have to have our hood systems uh, inspected twice a year in all of our cafeterias and in our CTEC culinary program. So that's expensive. And then you find items that are not working correctly. You have to do do repairs there. And if you go to the Pago plan where I've indicate we need funding to continue to reinstall and re-engineer the hood systems. A few years ago, they dismantled the hood systems and we didn't have fully functional kitchens, so you couldn't braise meat, brown meat, or use part of the equipment in the cafeterias. I've been trying to put that back since I got here. But once you put that back, then you have to have inspections. You have to have grease traps cleaned and different kind of things that, that, are, that are part of doing business. So that kind of illustrates it. Um, on the right hand side is where I put information about our lawn, our lawn mowing contracts. The slide some more so you can see that all the information to the right, Mr. Walker, on the, the mowing contracts. You can see for mowing and, and herbicide spraying, we're, we're spending um, uh, almost half a million dollars to get, to get that work done throughout the year at all of our, 
all of our sites, that number feeds back in over to the to the left into the total uh, when you look at all the types of service contracts that we enter into. And I've also put in at the very bottom a contingency for service contracts. Again, because you never know what tomorrow holds. For instance, here in this in this year, just recently we've had to add uh, add some handicapped sidewalk handicap sidewalk at EM Holt because we had students that couldn't get to where they needed to go. Uh, we had to have the contract uh, contractor for concrete go over to Sylvan where we had to add a parking lot in the back for pre-K, which is you're supposed to have and we didn't have, but then when we put the parking lot in, we had to put a sidewalk in to get, get the parents and the students because they, they walk them into the, to the classroom. There's no sidewalk. So things come up all the time. Uh, you know more about concrete. We did some repairs at turn time. We have some repairs on the table for Eastern's concrete bleachers. We have things all the time. That's an example just around, I, put, I think I put masonry or concrete in the list for 20,000. That's, that's what that would be. It could be higher. Uh, we may not use it all. I would think we'd probably use more than that just based on what I'm seeing. The, the 453, 365, and the, and the other um, table. Does this table add up to that 453? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, are these, are these tables linked? Uh, yes, the, yes, the number. So if you look at uh, the total requested for maintenance service contracts, the $2.2 million proposed, right. if, if you go back, uh, Mr. Walker, to that, and you go to the bottom, that number is, is in here. Uh, total regular service contracts that excludes our, our custodial. That's what that is because I have custodial listed as a separate line item there. And so you can see that. And then I've, I've put that 700,000 that I'm suggesting for preventative maintenance for HVAC and roofs. I put it as a separate line item because it's new and that pushes it up to 2.9 for service contracts. Um, so that's uh, that's where that comes from. Is the 453 number, is that, are, are those new contracts or are they increases to existing contracts or both? For the increase, I'm looking at just the increase. Okay. 453 to 365. Yes, so all I'm asking for on the continuation, if you go back to the first tab, Bruce, uh, down at the bottom right, the total increase is 1.378. And if you reference that to Dr. Harrison's slides where he right. said 1.4, that's that's the difference in yeah. service contract with of the 1.378, 700,000 is the addition of the service contract. So, and I'm just trying to dig into a piece of it just sure. to understand. So, if you got the, the 453, 365 is the increase in the maintenance service contracts, is that increase related to the other slide which lists the contracts? Or, or are they, is, that, is that additional money for existing contracts or those new contracts or additional services? Bruce, can you go back to the, so I can find the, the, the 453 number at the bottom. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping I have my math, math, math correct. Um, so the, the total service contract uh, is 2.9 um, for, uh, and that includes 2.2 and the seven. Um, so um, Bruce, if you go back to the first, uh, you may be correct, uh, and I think that Mr. Turner, what you may be alluding to is, uh, I'm just trying to, find, I'm just trying to bear, no, uh, understand the, three, the increase, no, okay, what the increase okay, is. Okay, I see it now. Bruce, one more time, let's go back to the list. So if, if you go to the uh, total service contract where it says 2.9, right. but I have it separately, uh, it's 2.2 for total service right. contracts and seven. Right. So if you go back over to the, the first tab, you can see that I have the 2.2 and, and the seven there separately to illustrate we have one new and one is continuing. If you look to the left, the current budget has 1.8 million in it for service contracts, which I have exceeded. Uh, when I, when I uh, first came, the, the budget was set at $1.8 million for service contracts. And, and my department was trying to open over two and a half, two and a half million dollars in service contracts. So we can't, you can't open that much if you're not budgeted for that much. But the, the 1.8 that was in the budget, and this has probably been in there for years, is just not enough for the service contracts that we need to have. But the, I guess in you know, reference to your question, the 2.2 is what I think we need next year, the proposed. 
but that's exclusive of the 700 for the preventative maintenance. So I'm asking to just to increase that budget line item by 453, but the total increase for maintenance budget is the total 1.3, or what Mr. Harris, Dr. Harrison had is 1.4. Okay. So let me ask the, if you get, a, if you get an additional four hundred fifty-three thousand dollars for, for maintenance services contracts, what does that buy? What is the additional four hundred fifty-three buy that last year we couldn't buy? Well, um, if you go back to the to the sheet where I have the budgets, uh, you know all of those. Uh, uh, yeah, this one right here. Yeah. If you could see what what we get, like gym floors, uh, I think I had in there last year uh, forty-five thousand dollars. In, you know, in what we needed, I thought we needed to refinish the gym floors in the summer. It's it's sixty, so you have increases. I'm just thinking as, as we're talking, you know, in twenty one, I think the year year over year inflation was four point seven in twenty one. It was eight percent in twenty two, and it was four point one percent in twenty three. So if you take any hundred dollar basket of goods that you would have bought uh, in twenty. Uh, then across those years, it would have been $117, not $100. So the percent increase in any $100 basket of goods, including these things, is 17%. Uh, just a percent increase. That's not, you know, just adding the inflation up. That would be doing the math across the years. And I think that's what we're seeing here, but not just here, but across every budget. If you take where what the budget is uh, for 23-24, the 10.9, the which is what it was the year before and the year before, um, but if you looked at it and said, hey, what if, what if uh, every $100 was increased by $17, which it should be, then, then this number wouldn't be 12.330 uh, for the, the budget we need. It would be more like $12.8 million. I'm not asking for that, but I mean, I'm just kind of illustrating the point that we've, we failed to recognize inflation across years when we come to ask money. I say, well, this is the first time I've stood here uh, like this, but... I think that's important, and then I just go back to what uh, uh, Andrea mentioned when she talked about uh, their bills and utility bills and the way they're forecasting and, and Duke Energy's forecasting, um, and it's it's in the news every day, uh, what, what what we're having to pay, and it gets passed right back to us for every everything we have to buy. So what more do we get? We don't, I'm not saying we get any more, we, we get what we need, which is probably about what we got last year. I had some other questions about the, the, the topic slide. Sure. Thank, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I understand all of my items. Um, this one? Uh, no, the, the continuation. Salary increase. So, I just want to make sure I understand. 3% is what the General Assembly has already passed to increase teacher salary. Wow. Correct. Um, if I were a bet man, I, I, I bet that's not going to change for this year. I don't know. That's what we're betting as well. Yeah. Okay. So the 755 is a, essentially a, a corresponding 3% increase to what the county pays in supplements to teachers, APs, and principals. Is that right? Correct. So plus, you, plus some locally paid teachers. So it maintains whatever percentage, what I guess Mr. Lashley said 11 to 17 percent. 11 to 14 or 15 percent. Okay. It maintains that same. Right. So when their base salary goes up by 3 percent, as Mr. Lashley pointed out, their, their 11 percent becomes more. Now, we're, we're missing a number of teachers in the district. Correct. Is the 755 based upon the number that are allotted or the number that we have? Based on the number that's allotted. Um, the retirement with the ones also that are we know are going to be local are added to that. So there are like the 53, the enhancement teachers; those are also included, as well as some of our other um, instructional staff that are on the other slides. <clears throat> the retirement rate increase—that's a legislative pass through that the county just has to pay. Correct. Um, Health insurance, again, the legislature passes a uh, health insurance package for teachers. This is the, the county's part that we have to pay. County's portion, correct. Um, utility increase, we've covered that. What is the step increase? Step increase, our classified personnel uh, are on a salary schedule, and the increase going into next year would be $50,000 total. Okay. Can you tell us about 
Um, the chart is going crazy. So this is another example of, of, of a pass-through um, requirement for counties to pay that the state puts upon us. Correct. Um, but it, I think I think you said that the number is based upon a ten percent student uh, of our students, but also that the we're estimated that our number of students is going to go down. Correct. So why would the why would we have an increase in the number of charter school students for ABSS at all? We did not project, project as many charter school students as we had last year, so some of this is catching up for last year. We're actually in the red on our charter school line item, and you know, it's my, our guess is the charter school is open, that some of that 580, or that, uh, what was the line? Yeah, 581, some of that 581 going to show up for charter schools. So the, the ten, it's the 10% of what our local, what our total local budget is. So previous to this year, we spent about $4 million in charter schools. This year, we're already up knowing that we're going to spend $4.8 million. So we under budgeted about $700,000. Um, so we're in the red of that piece of it. So we know that we need to add that back in because we don't see it going down. More than likely, it will go up. So that 700000 is outside of the 10% that we have to give them just for the pass-through. It is the number that we have to pay uh, because we we didn't budget correctly going into this school year. Does that number also include, or does it <coughs> not include, the, uh, the optional 10% that the county can, can spend on maintenance? For it does not include anything on capital. Are there any are there any savings at all that ABSS receives by not having to educate the children that are in charge? And I'm talking about year over year budgets. Is there any savings at all? Um, we're we're serving fewer students because the students are going there, going to charge school. But we're also, you know, losing that their state dollars, um, and so the. I would, I would say yes, there's probably a little bit of savings. It's hard to quantify. It's hard to quantify. To, to be fair, I mean, you know, the, I mean, uh, you still have the same operating costs, so. Right, it, you know, some of the things, you know, at a school, that if the children, if the 500 children came out of one school, then we close the 500 state school. But when they come out of 10 from here, 20 from there, and that was one of the things we found with the virtual school last year, we, the way we were allotting, but we had so many uh, ninth graders, but they're coming out of six high schools. And that's why we felt we really needed to tighten up that uh, a lot of for you. Our money goes through 35 charter schools. So it's not just the charter schools here. Um, we have 2,480 current students that go to charter schools, but there are 35 charter schools that we send money to. We send money as far away as Uori uh, Academy. It's a good school, but it's it's Uori. It's wow. It's way. Past, I mean, it's past Asheboro, but we have kids that attend there, um, and that we have to pay for because their residence is in Alamance County. Yeah, I sure don't like the sunny model. Well, there's nothing really. <laughs> uh, that, that's all the questions I have right now, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Horner. Do you have more? I just had one other one I'll follow up on that popped up back when we were talking about student class dispersion. And a comment was made about the dual language class would allow for higher student concentration. That kind of sounded counterintuitive to me. I mean, in, in the early grades, um, what happens is we see attrition over the years so if we have a kindergarten dual language class if it if the class starts at 18 just by natural attrition that that class is going to probably be down to 10 okay. or 11 by the time they get to fourth okay. grade so the state so is allowed an exception or 24 will come back down below the right. 1 to 19 or 1 to 18 ratio i got you okay mm -hmm. what we have not talked about is school performance 
which are the uh, I, low, where are we? Talk about that if you will. I'll have to yield to uh, Ms. Johnson, but our. And if you would go to the microphone, we could hear you. So I shared a document um, with you. We currently have 17 of our 38 schools are identified as low performing schools. And so this year we were more strategic at what did we put in our, in our school improvement plans? What are we doing at the district level to support that movement as well? Some of the things that we've done differently, we have now formed a district improvement team that meets twice a month. Um, it's regular, we've been doing it for two years, which is what we should have been doing all along. Um, we actually put our minutes online so that the public can see that along with the school improvement plan. You can go on any of those sites and see that. In that district improvement team meeting, we also talked about are we intentionally using dollars from the federal that the federal government sends us to be able to help schools and help move achievement. So we did that this year. We looked at the needs of our kids and we started in elementary school because we know if they don't get that solid foundation there, by the time they get to middle and high, we start seeing them either sometimes with discipline issues, um, they fall so behind that they become disinterested in school and they eventually drop out, which then becomes a county issue. Um, and that's what we didn't want to happen. We're using our, we, this year we used our federal dollars, uh, first of all, for an elementary literacy tutoring program. Um, we hired retired teachers, we hired uh, folks who we knew could use a literacy program that would, had been vetted, um, a research-based program. Our principals identified students who were on the bubble that just needed that extra push to be able to move forward. Um, we've been a little excited. Everything's preliminary. We're in the middle of EOGs right now, but we're seeing some movement with those kids. In our K-2, we saw some in-class growth. That's another assessment that we give to see how the kids have done since we started our tutoring program. So we're actually starting to see growth because these tutors work 30 minutes, 45 minutes with these kids a couple times a week. And so they're getting that individualized attention. Another thing that we've also added was data days. Um, you know, you hear a lot of times schools talking about we look at our data, we look at our data. Unfortunately, though, with everything, the other mandates that we have to do at school, our teachers don't always have time to dig into the data and really do something with it to individualize instruction. Um, gone are the days where we can walk into a classroom and everybody is an even playing field. You have kids that are way above grade level and you have kids that are sitting in a high school classroom on a second grade reading level. So what we did for all K-12 schools this year is we gave them two data days each semester and we at the central services pulled the data for them because we didn't want them to waste a, a time doing that and we used our federal funds to, to provide subs and coverage and the teachers dug into their data and they were able to form groups of who needed what type of help, what skills are they missing and how can we better serve our students. Um, at the high school level, not only did they do that for the tested subjects, but they looked at kids who are in the ninth and 10th grade currently who may be showing signs either through attendance or discipline of possibly not graduating within four years. So our graduation coaches took that data and we formed small groups in with that. We did surveys at the end of each of these because with the federal dollars, you have to do a survey of what people thought unanimously across the district, teachers said this was the most valuable thing that we've done because we actually got time because we provided that to really dig in to see how can we help our kids even more. Um, with our strategic, or with our school improvement plans, the 17 low performing schools had to identify the areas that they were going to work on within their own school. Um, and each one of them had to provide checkups to the state within the school improvement uh, system to be able to show where they were, what they needed support with, and so we were able to do those things. Yeah, define, good portion of us know what low performing means, but not everybody is listening. Define low performing. Okay, in a, in a low performing school, it's where the majority of the kids are scoring below a level three, on assessment. So their, their majority of their kids are scoring at a level one or a level two. 
Um, so how many levels are there? There are four. Yeah, five. Five when we go up into it. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Three to five is proficient, and then one and two is not. And four and five means you're career college ready. Is there a letter grade assigned to those Loop 20 schools? It's it's an F, but it also could be a D um, because we have there are several things that play in part to that low performing. So if the growth isn't met, so maybe they're at a D, but they showed no growth and their growth went backwards, they could actually be in that D column as well. Our hope, um, I'm gonna knock on wood, and is that we are gonna see some folks coming off. Our goal all year academically has been not to add any more. Um, I don't know if you saw my presentation earlier this year, if we add one more school, we'll become a low performing district, which means the state will come in with a lot more stricter things that we must do. I'm excited about some of the things we've been seeing before EOGs. Um, I think we've got some great principals who've really taken it to heart of what our <coughs> real job is, um, which is it's the kids. And I feel really good about the federal dollars that we spent this year. To me, they've been intentional. You know, they're not necessarily <coughs> buying people and, and those types of things or programs. We've actually spent it doing the things that kids need um, and investing in our students. Of those 17, how many D's and how many F's? Let me pull that document up, I apologize. Hey, if you can just provide that, that sort of information uh, as as Mr. Carter and Mr. Lashley I also have an undergraduate degree in business and accounting so I know the numbers look at the numbers carefully and I agree Dr. Harrison uh, the more numbers we have the better we will understand what the needs are and the concerns uh, I particularly would like to know and this is more to Dr. Harrison I guess um, but it yeah. has so many vacancies. For example, even in not just teachers, um, but maintenance and uh, HVAC repair people and roofing people and whatever. I'd love to know how many vacancies were there for 23-24, and do you anticipate the same number? I know it's hard for you guys to hire an HVAC person, for example. Uh, same thing for the county. Uh, they're in demand and their salaries are uh, considerable. Yeah, I think that um, school systems across the country are having a hard time finding people teachers. Um, last I saw, the state needs about mm -hmm. 12 or 13,000 teachers a year. Our institutions of higher education provide about five or six thousand. Um, Pennsylvania used to be the biggest exporter of teachers in the nation. They have changes. Uh, they have a shortage now. When I became superintendent in Cumberland County in 1997, we typically have 500 vacancies a year. We have 3,500 teachers and in 97, probably 70% of our new hires came from North Carolina. When I left there in 2009, probably 30% of our new hires came from North Carolina. So, uh, and, and I would argue that our, our General Assembly is not making teaching um, attractive in, in, in North Carolina. Um, I don't think our teachers are valued by the, by the General Assembly. Uh, we have some things in place uh, with our beginning teacher support program. Um, I think uh, Ms. Johnson and, and her team have put some teacher support things in place, but that's a, uh, that's a industry, if you will, wide uh, problem. And I think we need to, as a, as a nation, need to, to value our teachers a little more. And I'll say one thing on the, on the letter grades. Uh, there's almost a one-to-one -one correlation between poverty and grades. Um, and I was chairman of the state board and the General Assembly passed that legislation and I can remember standing before Jillian Oversight and telling them that if we do this, we don't need to, we can save all this money on testing because I can tell you who the A's, B's, C's, and D's and F's are. And it's 
stayed pretty much true. I think if you look at our schools, if you look at them across the state, there are very few outliers. Um, but poverty, learning grades a, a correlation. You had Southern High, Graham High, you just um, I heard completed contracts for both those roofing. And Mr. Hook, that's probably a question for you. Uh, have those contracts been signed, executed? When will construction begin? And um, where are we on completion of those two roofs? Chairman Paisley. Could I ask Ravon to something, Ms. Johnson, before she sits oh, down? Oh, sure. I, I know. I just didn't want her to sit down because I know Greg's going to come up and I've got a bunch of questions for him, too. Is that okay if I do that? Sure. Okay. I'll take a second. Um, can you just give me, if you've got it in front of you, uh, the list of the 17 schools? Yes. Um, so the low-performing schools, we have Graham High School and Cummings, but they both have D-letter grades. The virtual school with the D letter grade. Um, Turn time, Graham Middle and Broadview, they have F grades. Sylvan, South Graham, Andrews, Pleasant Grove, they have D's. North Graham is an F. Hillcrest is a D. Hall River, Newland, Grove Park are F's. BEJ is a D, East Lawn is an F, and those are it. Okay. Um, McKinney Vento, are they still housing some families for you know, crisis housing, temporary housing, whatever, at Motel 6 and Econo Lodge? Yes. Okay. The bus picks them up. Okay. Um, a lot of these schools that I just heard are real high poverty because poverty has a different look now. It's it's all kind of different things that goes into that bucket. Um, I think this is a, a real valid point to show how important student services are, how important social workers are, and graduation coaches are, and all kind of stuff because um, a lot of these children don't walk to school with a pretty lunch box. They're depending on schools to feed them breakfast and lunch and sometimes take home meals if they've got that. Um, and just the crime, the criminal level in some of the homes that we've got, you can walk across the street at the jail and see there are plenty of people over there that don't pay their child support because they just don't. They're always in and out of the system constantly. And just the drug crisis in our county and the juvenile crime crisis in our county. Um, it, and then the dropout rates. It's, it's you know, it, it kind of all goes into one a real ugly bucket and that lays on the kids. And we see that walk into our schools. And 17, I'm glad there's just 17 with what we have because, um, you know, just like the world, we got really rich and we got really poor and in the middle we got struggles. And uh, we, just, we just can't forget what makes up and the why in these 17 schools because the other that adds up to the 38 are working and struggling too. They just hadn't got that, that check that box yet. So um, I just um, want us to realize how important our student services are to these kids and to these families to get them where they need to be, which um, is not always a great place to start with. So thank you. Additionally, when you report it back to us, uh, in lieu of um, yeah, 10,004-A-W-E, you can figure out what it is. But spell it out for us guys, make it easier, please. And your labeling. <clears throat> Use less codes and less. Uh -huh. Oh, AWE is Alexander Wilson, and right. their school code, in case you, because all of this is available on the state website, right. but their school code, we want to make sure you have that, is 10304. Right. And I, I knew. Yeah. Case, my wife taught for 42 years and she ran into the code. So, she taught my son, I'm well aware. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but having said that, uh, not everybody can read yeah. those codes or right. has the ability to look them up. So, thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm double checking my numbers here, but I keep coming up with 35. Is there? Race, well, CTEC is not on here. They're a school um, because they their scores go back to the home schools. And then 
Uh, south, these scores here from last year, Southeast just opened this year, so they will not be on there. They will be on this upcoming year. Um, but there should be, there's 38 schools now, but Ray Street is on here. Um, Ray Street, we vote on a different model for Ray Street um, because of their being a, an alternative school, the state gives us options. And right now the state has listed them as in progressing. Right, that would make 30, 36. So the other two you said were. Seven, six, six, seven, eight, 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 seven, Yes, sir, you were asking about uh, the, the status of projects. So uh, when I first came, <coughs> um, I learned there was a top 10 list. I think we've kind of picked away from using that language. We had a top 10 and the next 10. Uh, so of the, uh, the items that were on the top 10 list, all of them are under contract or in uh, progress, works in progress or completed with the exception of Southern High School. Uh, Southern High School, uh, we ran into some uh, design design issues there. Um, so we're still working working through that. Uh, Southern, Southern High School, since you mentioned it specifically, uh, the initial design plan had a metal roof on the auditorium area, but then the, we found that the way the design was made, it was gonna dump all the water in the back parking lot and go down to the football field, which uh, my department several years ago fixed that problem so we had to we're going to redesign on that part of the roof as well as some of the pod buildings when we talk about pods a b c and d uh, the pod buildings that are connected into the southern high school the new addition the metal roof design they have they're having to work around some corrections there to make sure that they're able to make uh, the metal roof system on the pods fit with with the new addition so we should be uh, pretty pretty close on completing that design soon um, they're going to start work on Graham High School. Graham High is under contract. Uh, they're going to start work there on the, on the 10th of this month. Graham Middle is over 50% complete on that roof project. Hall River Roof should be done any, any day now. So we've made good progress. The, the middle school cameras that were on the list that, that you all had funded uh, with capital reserves, um, we were able to use those monies uh, at Western Middle and Woodlaw. Those projects are complete. We're just waiting on the final billing. And out of those two, out of the five hundred thousand, we'll be able to give. I think it's twenty-eight thousand, more or less, back back to capital reserves. We kept them separate so we didn't mix money on on those projects. So, uh, and then um, al along those same lines, in reference to the next ten list, we're three deep on that list too. We have a contract to take to the board for BEJ uh, roof replacement at the next board meeting, so that will be ready to go for summer. Um, and then we have a Western Middle design is complete. We're awaiting funding, which is tied to the, uh, um, the, the June 18th uh, bond money release. So Western Middle will be ready, ready to be it. Uh, and then Western High is, is in design. Um, and then also we discovered um, collaboratively that Eastern High should have been on the, the next 10 list and it was nowhere on any list and we pulled it up and that one is design, in design as well. Uh, so I think we're making great, great progress on, on all those projects. Um, in reference to some of the, the larger high schools, the work there will be more or less a year-long proposition. There's so many roof sections that with, it'll be done in, in phases uh, through throughout the year. So uh, I think we're doing well. What's your completion forecast for Graham and for um, Can you repeat the question? Completion forecast. Um, I think we'll, uh, if we begin uh, at Graham, uh, Graham High uh, on Monday, uh, that we're probably looking at nine, nine months. But uh, I mean, based on the way things have gone, I, and I've said before, I don't want to give you all um, any kind of uh, mis misleading promise dates. Uh, so, I mean, that's just, just the, the way I would see it. And I would think at Southern High, once the, the, the design is done, uh, then, then 
nine months from the time that we, we begin work there. Uh, we had three driveway projects that were in that top 10. Uh, Alexander Wilson looks complete, uh, but one of our, our third party testers, again, back to the service contracts, we contract with a third party uh, materials testing group. They discovered that the density or the compaction of the driveway was not correct. So they have worked with the, the designer uh, to uh, specify to the contractor, you have to mill kneel down the top layer of the complete driveway and redo the top layer. Whose fault that. was that? Sir? Who caused that error? Well, the, the, the contractor, you know, they put, they they ended up late, and this is one of the things that, that happens with asphalt projects. If you end up putting asphalt down in cold weather, you're not gonna get the correct compaction. And so when you bid those asphalt projects late and you begin them late, then that's one of the things you could run into, but the contractor's gonna stand behind it and that's not costing us any money. He's gonna take care of it. That was my next yeah. question. <laughs> so that, yeah, that was my concern too. So that's all gonna be fixed, but that, that really ties back to the service contracts where we employ third party testers and they do the same thing when we do a track like at Cummings or the track project that we've begun at Western. They'll be down there, they do soil sampling and then they do compaction testing on the end product to make sure that all is above board before we before we pay and we'll get it all all corrected but back to the driveway projects in the top 10 the original top 10 we had the aw project which uh, we're using that driveway and it's you know usable and it looks good but we're going to get that top layer corrected uh, the, the em Holt driveway project uh, they're on site now there's a backhoe down there and they've got all the the, the new uh, driveway plan flagged off and they're ready to uh, break the ground as soon as the kids are out of school uh, Friday uh, the, the 7th so that was ready uh, to go and we have a contract on the AO driveway project uh, and they'll begin that uh, probably uh, middle middle or late June uh, so those all, all those driveways should be completed during the summertime so we're making great progress there and in a couple of er other areas because I came through here on these projects the coming track we have a couple of uh, punch list items to button up at, at the Cummings track, but we're using that track and it's great. And then we've already uh, broken ground and, and started tearing up the uh, the Western High track. But I came here and asked for lottery money months ago. But, but you know, I asked for money for these projects that involve asphalt, but you, you cannot begin them until until warm weather. So that's, that's where we are now with regards to those. Well, I am extremely pleased with the school board and the administration in your hire. Uh, things are moving so much quicker now that you've come on board and I appreciate it. I think we all appreciate that. Uh, all of you guys are important but this guy's a major key. Well thank so, you. I appreciate your accolades. And I still would not have your job for any amount of money. <laughs> But, Don't yeah. say that to him. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Lashley has a question for you. I just wanted to verify something because uh, me and Craig Turner, uh, back when we, I guess when you, you mentioned uh, AO or AWA, uh, is there any, this is back when your previous person in your position told us that we would get reimbursed for some of these driveway projects or, or uh, the asphalt sort of threw me off but I'm still hoping that there's some way somehow somebody the knows that, that we are to to be reimbursed from the state for these driveway projects that, from some of the things we've done in the past couple of years. And um, that was my next question. <laughs> uh, so uh, you're referencing what they call the spot mobility program the NCDOT uh, funds that program and they have a selection process. So applications were submitted uh, once 30% designs were completed on each of those driveway projects. Applications were submitted for that um, uh, program uh, and only the EM Holt driveway project was, was selected, which uh, uh, is, is a good project to, uh, uh, to apply that money to. So the way that works, uh, Mr. Lashley, is it's a reimbursed after completion and so uh, we've already had a, a little conference with, with the DOT to ensure we know how that, that works. But uh, essentially after EMO is all done uh, and we've done all the pay apps on that project, uh, then uh, they would reimburse a maximum of $750,000 
against allowable costs. If we think all the costs there are allowable, I think the budget there is 1.2, 1, 1.2. 1 uh, we're just a little under budget there, but um, I would expect to get the, the full 750000 back to, to give back to capital reserves. After completion? After completion, okay. And Thank then you. that money goes back into your capital fund, is that correct? Yes, sir. Oh, if, that's, if that's where you put it, we'll just send the check back over here yeah. to Susan. I might have snuck and asked the question beforehand. <laughs> um, so that money will be available for later spending for capital for the ABSS. Yes. But uh, that's important. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a question for you about comparing to these numbers to our peers. County gets a book like this from the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. I'm wondering if the school board association provides some sort of peer comparison for the status of schools performing, low performing status. Well, we've got one one A, and that looks like, if I'm reading the abbreviation correctly, that would be the early college. Yeah, I think it's. Um, the State Department has that accessible on their web page. I know they don't produce a, a document with comparisons. I, just th I think it would be interesting information for us to take a look at where we stand as compared to peer counties, similar size, similar size school population, and see how many, see if the, the numbers are stacking up. Just yeah, I think one of the things that we need to, to get back to, and, I, and we're going to try to start the process a little bit this summer, but are really setting some academic benchmarks. And I think the first couple of years with the benchmarks, we compare ourselves with ourselves and, and look for continuous improvement. But by year three, we need to, to look at school districts that we, with, with whom we want to benchmark. And I think we need to look at those school systems that we think are um, higher flyers to, to, to work to move. To, to inspire. So yes, I think there's some some value to that. But I think you know we're at the point right now um, I, I, that that we really need to um, identify our goals, our, our short range goals, and our and our long range goals. I, I don't know where we are with our strategic plan. I know we have something in place, but I think that was a real strength we had when I got here in 2014. That this community had developed that vision statement and the staff had developed a, a strategic plan to go with it. And I think that was kind of the thing that we were able to build our budget around and this is what we want to do. This is to that to which we aspire. Um, and I think with, with COVID and, and mold and, and all the stuff that's gone on the, the last couple of years, I think many school systems across the state and I think the state itself has gotten into kind of putting out fires and just um, trying to get through and uh, but I, I think we're at a point, and again, that's, that's why I think it's so important that we go into July with a new superintendent coming in, that we're on a sound footing, that we can really look to the future and talk about. And I think that's something that we need to be at the table to, uh, together. I know Impact Alliance has a group together that's called, I don't know what they're called, but are, are kind of working around that, bringing community leaders together. And uh, so I, I think there's something really to be said about that. I will, I will say that um, the district improvement team that we've put in place these last two years, um, Dr. Davis and I chair that. It's the first time since I've been back, and I've, I've been here five years now back, that we are actually being intentional, and we look at that data, we look at our subgroups where those are, and we're actually starting to make intentional plans. Like I said, I don't see us knocking it out of the park and everybody coming off the low performing list this year because there's a lot of things that go into getting on it. But I do think we're going to see some improvement because of the work that this, the district, we have to model what we expect of the schools. And this is the first time I think that we've done that and been intentional with our spending to tone it in and to look at that data. Can you provide that projection, chart, whatever it's going to be? To us, the I, Commission. When by the end of next week, we'll have our preliminary scores, so I can put something together. But they'll be preliminary until the state actually finalizes them. Yes, sir. Thank you. Another, I think, another critical piece too in, in rebuilding um, confidence is going to be bringing in a really top-notch CFO. Financial information is critical. As I 
told Dr. Harrison earlier, I've had a school board member comment to me that he didn't feel like the financial information he had available to him was sufficient for him to do his job. So that's going to be a critical piece. And needless to say, we want to have confidence in what you provide to us. And I think we all know that's not been the case this past year. I was one of the, I know there were a lot of people that filled out your survey, and like it or not, I did that. <laughs> uh, but I emphasized in my survey response, one a superintendent likely with not only an educational background, but some business and an accounting background, uh, because that's a large part of what you do as a superintendent. Uh, and additionally, I uh, suggested, I'm glad I'm on my board, not yours. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to listen to me. But uh, uh, suggested that you do something similar to what ACC did and narrow your choices down and later, uh, before your final decision, allow the public to come in and at least hear from the possible potential new superintendents. I can, the board had serious consideration, discussion about that. Uh, I know a couple of people who have applied and they would not have applied if there were going to be a public setting. Um, you know, elected boards, with all due respect to my elected board, uh, boards are different than community college boards and higher education boards. I, I think this board is going to do everything they can to get input from, from the community. I think, this, I, I know this board is taking very seriously that feedback that they got, but it would have, and I think this is what the consultant told the board uh, the night he presented, that it would have seriously impacted the, the number and probably quality of uh, applicants. Um, I've been around a long time and we got some really, really good applicants. And that's positive. Now at ACC, we didn't publish the names of all the candidates or all the applicants. We but brought it up to a point, I was on the presidential select committee as well, and. Uh, we brought it up to a point where I think it, I can't remember if it was the top five. I believe it was. We, if you got into that category, if you wanted to be in that category, you were notified, and when you were notified in that category, it was going to be public. But beyond that, the, and the board would have had to done that uh, at the outset. And again, one individual who I talked to, he's in a great situation, good board, good community, and he wouldn't take the chance of being in the final three. So if it were, if it were public. I think we understand that and appreciate it. Um, and that's why you don't have to listen to me on that. <laughs> but having said that, I particularly do want, and I really ask fairly urgently uh, for a response on number of vacancies in this 23-24 budget, uh, not only on staff, uh, principals, assistant principals, uh, teachers, but more so or equally as important maintenance, um, all kinds of things of that sort, uh, because it gives us some insight as to what really, not just your needs, but what are you going to be able to fill? I think we had a number last year. Ms. Anderson can pull that number for you for yes. these like from different Thank points. Late last year, I think, or sometime earlier this year, we had a number that you were down from 71 to 25 in maintenance. Is that still mm -hmm. somewhat accurate? The number 71 was from years ago when we ran a full warehouse and supplies that that number wouldn't match what we what we do today we have a handful of a handful of vacancies most of which are because of transient nature of some Not apples and apples yes sir. so maybe you modify the 71 what you really think you need and then what you feel I'm not asking you to be creative. <laughs> no, no, we're we simply the um, percentage of vacant positions we have in each category. Yes. Board, anything else from this board? I just need to ask Mr. Hook something. He's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I, I have a question. When I was on the school board, there were so many school shootings, and the walls were a big deal. We thought everything possible for the safety of the campuses 
A, B, C, the difference, you know, that's a nightmare when it comes to security. Um, when I was at Graham, you've got the wall, you've got the big metal doors, but they're wide open because there's no security. Same thing with the other schools. I'm just curious, what kind of time are we looking before that's a completed job? Because that wall's doing no good with those doors wide open. So um, specifically the, the Graham campus, which, which you named. Um, and the back of the school with all the small swimming pools and just the parking lots, nothing but potholes and the gates broke. Just, it's got a lot of stuff that needs to be taken care of. Yes. Just wear and tear. Um, so um, the, the security walls that were in the design, initial design uh, from the Graham High Bond project uh, right. included the uh, security walls, I think what they they decided after Graham Graham was sort of the first project up, it was more practical instead of instead of walling off the entire campus with just a wall between the pod buildings to connect. So if you go to western, southern, and eastern, that that's what the way that was handled. But at Graham specifically, it has an ex exterior wall uh, that was part of the design, and it has several uh, doors that. Uh, really should be equipped with key card right. systems and key fob systems. Uh, we have uh, uh, in the in the PAYGO plan, the capital improvement plan for the 24-25 uh, year to re replace the, the cameras and add key card systems to Western High and to Graham, Graham High. So we've said here, I think when, when I first came here, saying the camera systems were 10 year old, 10 year old right. systems, now they're 11, but there were no key cards. So, that, that's what I'd like to do out of the, the capital improvement plan. That, that that wouldn't address Southern. Southern did not have security walls in the initial design of the bond project, so uh, that wouldn't apply there. Uh, Eastern has security uh, uh, gates there, so um, that that I think I have Eastern and Graham in the in the yeah. first year of the capital improvement plan, and then Western maybe in the next year. I have to go back and look at the order that I had them. Eastern is missing one section of a uh, security wall that was not in the design. Uh, I could pick that up, you know, in just in the, the contingency amount that's in the, the capital improvement plan to get the, to get that completed. But and then and we we could just add uh, a key card system. It wouldn't address re replacing the uh, the eleven year old cameras at East, you know, at the campuses. But we could address what you're calling this, this, you know, the safety okay. the safety measure. They are tied to the security walls. Okay, I know when Dr. Cox was my first school board uh, so superintendent, and I remember when smart boards were just like, they come right out of heaven. They were just the biggest thing ever. There were PTOs that even, you know, would raise money to buy one for a school or something like that. Are the smart boards being used in the classrooms, because you're talking about the 245,000, the projectors and all that, are they still a vital part of that classroom? Are they being used? Just like they've always been used, because that's a lot of money across the district. Well, well, they are, and so the the figure that's in the uh, 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 the continuation uh, suggestion that I had was projectors. Yeah. So when you look at a smart board system, you have the projector that's mounted above the board. The board just receives the projection, but it can be an interactive board. Uh, but that dollar figure is for the projection. Things have changed over time, and you know, it might be you know, more relevant to a, a curriculum discussion, but when those were put in, we didn't have Chromebooks, so we did a lot of interactive activities where students would come up and you could have multiple students engaging with a smart board. Uh, the smart boards are used every day, okay. uh, but they're probably most heavily used you know, for projection and class discussion and, and things like that. Lesser uh, amounts, uh, you know, in secondary school for interactive activity where you're actually touching them. Uh, and if you go to the new high school, uh, we didn't put smart boards in, we put screens like you see here because that's more practical in a high school. Uh, but the funding that's in the, um, in, in the suggested continuation budget is for the projection part of the smart boards because that's the part that expires over time and that we have they that they have a life cycle and we have to replace. Okay, and I noticed your custodial fee went up slightly. What what kind of higher expectations are we going to have of them? 
because that's always been a controversy every year because you get pros and cons depending on what school you're in. Uh, I'll talk to you about some things. And I'm just curious, is um, are the expectations for the custodian, that's a lot of money to clean the schools, to have the schools, the floors waxed, I mean the whole nine yards. So when a, the class and teachers go in that school, it just sparkles and it stays that way for five or five million dollars. I'm just curious, is it, do we have high expectations of these folks? Um, yes, we do. MFM um, deals with the same hiring situation yeah. in the school system and the maintenance department and every, every industry out there deals with. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's a very competitive market uh, for for the, the the type of employee that, that we're staffing because I mean, literally, they can they can have five job offers in one day right. and pick the one they want to show up to. Um, there's a lot of uh, transient nature uh, in that, but we do have some some folks that are, are have been tied to us for quite a while. We had the same uh, uh, complaints concerns when we dealt with. Uh, a company called Premier, and then we dealt with Bud Group, and then now with MFM. Um, when I first came, um, uh, the Board of Education, you know, asked me some some questions, and so I went back and did some repricing with some some of the uh, the folks that were involved in the RFP when Dr. Thorpe had done the, the RFP to choose MFM uh, to see what pricing would, would be like. We were two and a half or three million dollars away from the next one. Mm -hmm. One of the next one is one of one we already had uh, in the past. So um, you know, um, when, when you're having to shop for something inexpensive, you you get something inex inexpensive. We have high expectations, but but it, it's difficult because of the way that uh, they struggle with with staffing. Uh, so uh, you know, we 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 have uh, uh, things they're supposed to do daily, and weekly, and monthly, and you know, we try to follow that and, and ensure that they do it. Uh, but they have been responsive. I mean, and that's, that's, I think that, that for me has been important. When a school expresses concern to me, uh, and I go back to their, their district management for MFM, they, they do respond. Um, so that they work well with us. But at the, at the price point where we are uh, with our contract, um, you, you probably have to double that to, to, if you wanted to rehire ABSS staff, which was the way it was when I first came. But one of the facets that's gone now uh, that we could rely on in the past, uh, we were able to, to, to pull in folks who were maybe in their twilight years of, of working because they could come and work for, this, for the state mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and then they could uh, obtain that lifetime health insurance benefit. That was taken away a number of years ago so the draw that we have against Bucky's or, or McDonald's or, or Target for the same labor market, we don't have a draw. We don't have something that would, would pull you back to, to be a custodian. And I think that's you know the same situation we deal with when we have shortages uh, with, with bus drivers and other positions is the, the competitive market for, um, for the type of labor that we need. It's, it's, it's pretty rough. We see that across food services too, Red Lobster, all kind of stuff. I, I got, I'll email you my other questions. Okay. One more question. Yes, sir. Um, Prince, there was a book written, yeah, as I recall in the book, uh, a management book, management by walking around. And I know sometimes you can be overwhelmed by the amount of work you have to do, but one of the most critical things about observing your operation is walking through your operation on a regular basis. Is that something that's expected of principals today? Yes, sir. In fact, we've used time management to try to, like if we have discipline, not only are you going in the classroom to see what's going on there, but instead of having kids walk to the office where they may get lost, and take a little long we actually if, especially if it's something minor we can bring them out in the hall have the discussion deal with it there so that we are killing multiple stones or more multiple birds with one stone so yes sir we do work with them on that i want to thank school board members chair uh, vice chair 
administrators and everybody that's presented, both with ABSS and HCC. Really appreciate it. Um, we will not have work session until the 10th of June. So we've got a week off, although we have a uh, meeting Monday night, uh, which gives you guys time to pull some of the information we're requesting together. And I would really encourage you to get it to this board and to Miss York uh, early in the week, if at all possible. I understand testing scores and so forth will be somewhat delayed, but as early as you can, which will help us make hard decisions. But I want to thank you. Miss okay. York, would you approach? Okay. It is now 108. We've been in session much, much longer, uh, and I'm not blaming anybody, <laughs> uh, but they, we intended. So item number seven, Ms. Crawford, we're going to bump you to uh, June 10th. Uh, and if the board has other questions, I'm going to open this session up to questions that we have currently. I have one letter, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and it actually relates to, to the school system as well. Um, I think last time we met, there was some discussion about uh, Cummings High School bleachers and which way to go to make that fix. And I'm wondering if the school system had a recommendation or, or an ask. And if there's a deadline on yeah, the we appreciate the, our, our recommendation is the um, $325,000 project so we can get the, the work underway and, and get it going. If we were going with the replacement bleachers, we couldn't get started until November. They're in such a state. I had Mr. Hook the other day um, put tape around those bleachers. We're closing those bleachers. I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to sit in those bleachers. The company tells us that the um, $325 or $325,000 uh, would last us 20 years. And um, that's not a guarantee, but uh, that's kind of what our recommendation is. Is there a deadline to have that in the process so that they can be ready by football uh, Mr. Turner, the, um, the, the company that, um, <coughs> uh, that we work with, um, they, they've stated they need to order uh, the steel and the steel to be fabricated for the repair and they, they would like to uh, move on that to ensure that you know once they uh, get started they can get it completed in time for, for school to start. Um, so what they have suggested to me is if I gave them a letter of intent backing up that I was going to cover the cost that they would go ahead and, and, and Order the order the materials. Um, the reason I've held on that is because uh, I have it built into the uh, capital improvement plan, the PAYGO plan, at 325, and that's still on the table to be approved. So I've told them as of now I, I can't give them a, a, a letter of intent or anything that says yes, and I can't do a contract now because the, the funding's not there. So that's kind of that's kind of where, where I am now. The PAYGO that you were mentioning wouldn't be available until the next fiscal year. June right. 1st. If you got those funds July 1st, would you be able to complete the process by the boss season? Yes, it, it, but it's still tied to, if, if he waits to order the material July 1st, the answer is no. If I was to go back and, 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 and to communicate with him something formal that Yes, we're gonna we're gonna do this project, and I have funding for it. Then he's gonna go ahead and order order it on good faith. We talked about the funding that was available for from bond projects that there's enough there to cover that. Um, I don't even know is it is it proper? 
I don't know if this board's inclined to vote, but is it proper at this meeting to vote on yes. the issuance of bond monies for these bleachers? Yes, I think it could be. Um, I think it, it meets with the spirit of the purpose that was noticed for the meeting, number one, but then also the statute allows for new issues to be voted upon as long as all five members of the board are present. So either one of those would, would make that appropriate for today. Mr. Turner, I have a slide that illustrates, if you're interested, the, my calculations on what the amount of bond money that, that we have left, if you wanted to see it. Absolutely. Yes. While you're pulling that up, where feet go when you're sitting on the bleachers, is that going to be filled in like it was supposed to when you're talking about didn't pass up, wasn't up to code or something? Not up to code. There, you, you can uh, look on Google it for national bleacher standards and find that uh, a, a four inch sphere is what they define should not go through open places like, you know, the, the, the kickboards because that would be like a child's, a child's head. So uh, under the seats, uh, you know, you have your feet at, on the on the, the the ground, the floor, and you're sitting on the seat underneath. It's it's open like that, and so that the project includes closing that, but then around all of the railing, going up the stairs and all around the bleachers, it's it's wide open. And so they would uh, put in a, a chain link system, and that's what you see in, in modern high school stadiums. If you were to go to Southern High School, it's probably a good example. Their home side. You know, it's, it's basically uh, chain linked off. Anything of 42 inches above grade, you need to have it where a no four inch speeder can go through any 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 place. So there's the top side issues of code compliance, which is what I just referenced, and then the bottom side issue where the uh, all of the all of the legs on the home side um, would be we'd add on steel, probably two feet up. And, and to go down, we clean off the concrete footers that are there that you can no longer see. Uh, I think with TLC, uh, we can get a great number of years out of there. Out there, you know, like Dr. Harrison said, they said, well, these will last at least 20 years. There's no guarantee to that. But I think if we fix some uh, some drainage issues, you have water that stands under there. The steel legs have been just sitting in water all these years. But it, you know, if you have a lot of rain like we've had lately, there's a lot of water under there. But we can we can work on other other issues and, and, and I think we, we'd all be very pleased at how it, how it turns out. But this project amount fixes the code compliance on home and away. It re replaces or it does an add on to, to the bottom part of the legs, on the, all the legs on the home side. The, the water situation is, is not the same on the away side, but it would repair any leg that needs to be uh, repaired or added on to on the, on the away or the visitor side. I hadn't heard about the away side before. So that's new. In well, the code compliance is the entire thing. Right. Um, but I but there's just a, a handful of uh, feet on the away side, but they would take care of it all while they're there. Um, so uh, this, this. Before you go to your slide, Ms. Evans, Ms. York, do you have a recommendation as to funding this? You could authorize or reallocate bond funds, which we believe has an available balance of 1.9 to get this project moving forward. Absolutely. I think it's gonna be the consensus of this board to go ahead and do that. Absolutely. Um, do we have a motion? I'll make that my way to do it. Right, so in addition to 325 to 32, that would cover. Right, I think Mr. Hook had previously indicated we needed about 32,000 to close out the Cummins High School project. So that leaves a balance of about 1.87 um, that you could use to allocate the 325,000 for the bleacher repair. So, but your idea, you Greg, I'll let you make the motion and I'll second that like that. <laughs> well, you already made I'm good. <laughs> You're good, okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. I'm going to say, like I said last time, I'm for replacing them. I just don't want them back in here in a year and this didn't work or we need something else done to them. I just think they deserve to be replaced. That's Was all. That an That's I know. <laughs> I'm the four to one. You, I know you weren't for it last time, your last meeting. I, I wasn't here to vote. No, no, no. And I talked about no, I advancing them. I wasn't willing to pay to right, have them replaced right. because uh, 
how much to have them replaced? I mean, I heard one point one. Yeah. Now this three hundred twenty-five thousand, you just said would last for twenty years. I think. I mean, my opinion is it would last quite beyond that. Okay. If we if we take care of them, that's, that's a that's, that's a great fix. I, I, I won't be here in twenty years, so you know you have an opportunity to knock yourself out. Say that, Bill. You're, you're younger than I am. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm for the, I'm for getting them uh, fixed, and three hundred twenty-five thousand for twenty years sounds good to me. I hope that turns out. Okay, we have, we have four to one vote. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, commissioners, we also need one additional uh, motion and vote to occur. And that would be the authorization to transfer $357,000 from, I'm going to recommend the Southeast High Project um, to the Cummings High Project. You have voted to utilize the funds, but we would need that budget amendment to actually transfer the funds. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? I don't know what to do. So I'm not approving the other, so should I not approve this? I just I just want them replaced, but that doesn't matter. I'll say yes. You have a five oh because it's got southeast in there, it doesn't matter. Well, this just, is entirely different. Right. I'm good. Other issue. Okay. Do we have anything else for this meeting? No, sir. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll move. I have a motion to adjourn and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.local.gov tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.